learned how to build an electric car from a guy I met on the ham radio. Goes by Radio Dave out in Clear Lake. He's a he's a cool cat. <laughs> Welcome to the Scent and Bent podcast. We are here with Ryan Kalb. He's worked at Tesla, Rivian. He's an engineer. We have a bunch of questions for you because we recently drove our Tesla through a lake. And uh, <laughs> that's why Ryan's here. He's here <laughs> to fix it with us. Well, to yeah. fix it while we watch, basically. Yeah. But first, I think we kind of need your background before we get into what we did this week. Because before we turned on the cameras, you said that you built your first electric car for your senior project in high school. Yeah, yeah. So I built a Geo Metro electric in high school as part of like a senior project. Like um, ended up building it. We we're doing an introduction to engineering course at the same time. So a bunch of people were building like windmills and I was like, I'll build an electric car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that actually got learned how to build an electric car from a guy I met on the ham radio. So I was like, dude, that is awesome. Yeah, it goes by Radio Dave out in Clear Lake. He's a he's a cool cat for sure. He built an electric Geo Metro, and I'm like, I gotta I gotta do this. This is a sweet sweet opportunity. So built yeah. that, ran one time, and uh, then it got it running like eight years later again after that, and then it got decommissioned, and now another kid turned it into his first electric car. So nice. He took all the parts from it. Oh, perfect. Like that's awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. It lived <laughs> like another day. Yeah. yeah. So is that your first time like messing with electrical engineering and stuff? Or did you always, always. fiddle with stuff throughout yeah. your whole life? Oh, yeah. I was taking apart stuff all the time as a kid. Like VCRs, radios, you name it. Like modifying microwaves to do things. Not recommended, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> we were, yeah, we were just talking about this uh, yesterday, how the, we both like took apart VCRs for fun as kids. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. <laughs> but what can you do with the microwave? Um, well, I did try and uh, microwave and gasoline did not work. Oh. Unfortunately, I was hoping it would blow up, uh, <laughs> but for some reason it didn't work. It's probably because I cut the front of the door off. So all the radiation leaked out the front. Oh, mm -hmm. so, shoot. You know, that will happen. Yeah. <laughs> so, fun fact. If you, we put a, like a one foot, like aluminum foil ball in the microwave, it doesn't really do that much. But if you'd put like just a small dot of aluminum foil in the microwave, it actually reacts more because it's more concentrated onto like a single point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that was the idea was to try and make a spark in there, but there's too much foil and then there was no like way to con contain that radiation. Right. So mm -hmm. just unfortunately it didn't blow up. Yeah. So Sad. knowing what you know now, yeah. how would you blow that sucker up? <laughs> Put the door back on. I think I think it could work, and then less foil. Yeah. So, That's still on my bucket it. list of blowing up the microwave. <laughs> Got to wait until the winter. You know, safe right. times for them. Mm, no yeah. forest fires, kids. <laughs> <laughs> so after Geo Metro in high school, were you straight off to college then to learn what you know now? Or? No, I actually took a gap year. I like never took a foreign language in high school, so I actually had a hard time getting into schools. I was like an okay student, all things considered, uh -huh. but I wanted to do an um, automotive program. Uh, didn't get that opportunity as well kind of at the time, so I took a gap year and ended up working for a company building plug-in hybrid Prius conversions uh, in Berkeley and lived there, and kind of that's actually when I first started living in my van as well. So mm. I was out there and then did plug-in hybrid Priuses for a year there and then went to college studying electrical engineering. Yeah. Nice. Berkeley does seem like the place to do Prius things. Yeah. Things. <laughs> I've been there and yeah. it's like 60% of the cars are Prius. Oh, fun fact about the whole Prius thing too is that it was, uh, I remember getting into every car I pulled in the shop and I'm like, man, there's always this talk radio. And at the time I'm like, what's the point of talk radio? I didn't understand it at all. <laughs> and there was always people talking. My boss was like, oh, it's NPR. And I was like, What's that? Like National Prius Radio? <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was. Awesome. Realistic. Oh my god, that was like some special radio station that Prius funny. owners had. And I'm like, oh, now I know it's National Public Radio, yeah. but at the time, you know, yeah. I thought it was Prius Radio. Makes sense. So but when you say conversions, like, are you putting batteries in, like, what are you doing with a conversion on a Prius? Like, that's fair. That's fair. So basically, a normal Prius, right, is like a gasoline electric hybrid. Mm -hmm. And there was two different versions of conversions we would do. One was we would put uh, more batteries in there so the it would run the electric motor more often. Okay. And then as a consequence, get better fuel mileage. Right. Uh, and then the other version we would do was the more specifically plug-in conversion where we could switch it into electric mode. You could do the first 45, 50 miles of your commute on electric and oh, that's sick to charge instead of running yeah, the exactly charge mm -hmm. and it would the thing is the motor would never charge the battery you had to plug it in every night right mm -hmm. yeah that but it works it was it was pretty cool 
I got second place in a mileage fuel mileage challenge too. We got three thousand eight hundred eighty two miles per gallon. That Whoa. being said, the gas engine just didn't turn on. That's just what the gauge said. Right. <laughs> That's crazy. That just pure electric. Yeah. yeah. So that was that was a fun little competition. Like three of us never it turned on. It was just whose gauge randomly said the thing at a certain time. Gotcha. So, yeah. Which van was it that you started living in there? That was a, one of your uh, Volkswagen. Yeah. So the, I had a, a ninety. It was, it was actually a funny story. My first van was a van again. Mm-hmm. But I got it. I found it on Craigslist for two hundred dollars. And as a, when I saw the van, I was like, I think I've seen your van before. Were you on the Bay Bridge like three weeks ago? And he's like, Yeah. I was like, Was it on fire? He's like, Yeah. I'm like, Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> I was driving across the bridge and saw it there, and I was like, I'll take it. So nice. That's took it, awesome. threw a new motor in it, drove it for a long time, sold it to this Australian couple. And uh, actually started working for a company called the Bus Lab in Berkeley, who only mm. does van yeah, again. And I'd help them out as a just so I could get parts for my van at the time. Right. And then I switched to uh, 85 Westy after that. Nice. And that was the last 12 plus years have been with that van primarily and a few others. Nice. Dude, that is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Westies, Westies, cool. Westies are the best. Westies are the best. It was a good steal too. 2000 bucks for that Westie. Oh, yeah. Yeah, That's it was a good deal. Premium. That yeah. is a proper steal. It was a proper <laughs> steal. Now it's to be swapped at the blown head gasket, so it's living up to its Ah, oh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> Classic Vanagon and yep. Subaru. And Subaru. And Subaru. Yeah. Yeah. Living up to both expectations at once. Right. <laughs> All of the head, head gasket failures. Yes. <laughs> so after um, the gap year then, um, how did you get to the point where you were working at Tesla? Oh, so while I was doing those plug and hybrid Prius conversions, I just started applying to Tesla as like to be an intern. And, um, just cause you saw a lot of excitement about what they were doing and yeah, wanted to be I'm, a part of it. Exactly. I mean, I've always wanted to build electric cars. Like that's just like since high school, I was like originally wanted to build a, I wanted to build an RC car at scale and didn't have to do with that building an electric car. So I built the electric car first and realized, Oh, this is actually really cool. Like you can, combine it all together mm-hmm. but um so i applied to tesla as an intern didn't get it that first year i told the guy the prius was a stupid car and he had his prius and so it didn't go well during the interview. oh no <laughs> <laughs> so that was kind of funny uh and then applied the next year kind of similar problem wasn't like the right fit and then the third time i applied while i was in college i think it was my sophomore or junior year i did get in and then i just never left they offered me a full-time position after being an intern for like nine months and i just was like yeah They're like are you gonna finish school yeah and then i just didn't finish school <laughs> nice. so, perfect yeah and i was there for just under five years so okay yeah. that's a long time and what were you doing there primarily Kind of varied. I started off doing system validation around body controls functionality. It was right around the time they were designing the Model X. So I was focused on like testing and making sure all the body systems were talking correctly. So if you press the button on the screen, is the door opening at the right time? Right. If you're turning on your turn signals, like are all the turn signals flashing within like 10 milliseconds of each other? Like a bunch of that sort of testing around right. that environment and like designing systems to do that from the ground mm. up. So I kind of wrote... Like a, and design some boards to do all that testing automatically so you didn't have to do it by hand. Mm. So that was like the first thing I did and then switched into body controls firmware and was writing software for Model X and helping bring up um, the line at the factory. I remember sleeping at the factory many days of the week <laughs> like in my boss's van which was really funny because he had one and he was like oh can you fix my van and I was like sure uh-huh. so I drove it to the factory and I'd work on it at night a little bit and then like work during the day in the factory like trying to bring that up and then switched lastly to like more full time was in body controls uh, not body controls but specifically systems integration focused on latches wipers and um, a little bit of special projects I did some work with the Tesla Semi and then also focused primarily on Model 3 and did all the integration for the door handles, the latches on it, and the wipers. That being said, I didn't design the door handles. Just I just made, made them, them work better. Work better. <laughs> yeah. You don't yeah, want to take the blame for the Tesla door handles? No, I mean, I, I think they should be definitely different personally. Like, I think that mm-hmm. there's not enough people know how to use yeah. them, unfortunately, yet. But I have a few questions about all that. First, it seems like this stuff comes pretty naturally to you. Yeah. If you're doing the software and designing the boards and stuff, you're doing the software and the hardware with very little schooling. Is it just make sense in your head for some reason or what is it? Yeah, I guess, um, I forget that what it's called, but there's a specific type of like mindset that can visualize really well. Mm. And I kind of have mm. to like, I can like look at a motor and like explode it in my brain and be like, Oh, that sound sounds like maybe like, you know, rod number four, like looking at that or like, Oh, you have like a lower control arm problem or like, 
you know, just like it's like an innate sense to just disassemble and reassemble things. And it kind of also works within the electrical world as well. Like looking at a how electrons flow in a board and interpret potentially where like the error would be or like look at software. It's very like logical, not logical thinking is not the right word for it, but it's like you can kind of see the flow of like how okay. things move in like, yeah. space and like there's just an inherent awareness of that to some extent. So it's kind of like in math, you don't necessarily need to be taught how division works. When you're a kid, you can kind of think like, oh, this is a quicker way to solve this problem. Like it just kind of comes naturally. Or is there parts in it that you just have to have to learn like in a traditional way? Or do you just kind of like the more you thought about it and the more you fiddled with stuff, you just figured it out just on your own? I'd say it's both for sure. Um, A lot of what I learned was an in, something I learned as a kid and was more intuitive and actually I've lost a lot of that unfortunately with schooling really yeah oh. so I would say I'm actually a lot worse with electronics now even though I'm like good with them I'm not as good as I used to be there's like something at least in my head personally where once I've have two strategies for something I like go into a problem and I can't pick the strategy so I may have mm-hmm. learned it one way in college that you know they'll do something like when you're at school like oh like you know don't use a calculator. And then you eventually start using a calculator and you're like, well, you told me not to use a calculator. And then you're confused a little bit. Like, why am I using a calculator now? Mm-hmm. It's like right. kind of like that with electro, like electrical engineering or physics where like, just ignore resistance. And then they throw resistance in and you're like, oh, wind resistance. Like, what is this thing? Or um, at least in electrical engineering, like just different ways of like, oh, looking at how, if these resistors are in parallel or in series, like the math is the same, but how you start and think through that problem might be slightly different. And that's been, that's actually screwed as my more of like intuitive state and problem solving around electronics used to be a lot better. I could be like, Oh, like you see that this is like acting really weird and it's going too fast. Like, let me put like, you know, a capacitor in series here of like roughly this value and it should be better. Now I'm like, Oh, what's the math equation for that? And that's right. actually made it much more difficult. Oh, oh makes sense. Okay. yeah. Like you learn how you're supposed to do it the like official way yeah. and then like it makes it harder to do it any other way yeah. that's not yeah. that yeah and whereas if you don't if you don't know that official way you can just do it whatever way makes sense to you right? exactly which yeah. is like that's for me not no, like i don't understand electrical uh intuitively at all but like for mechanical stuff that's how i work too it's just like oh well what's the problem let's just how are we gonna solve it i don't know just figure it out Rather than like, oh, this is the equation to figure it out, or this is the official way to do it. You just do it however it makes sense. Yeah, and part of that's learning through failure. And, right. And uh, you, if you, it's really interesting, if you ever go to like automotive or really any industry, look at the people who fix the stuff and look at the people who design the stuff. Totally two different people, right? Yeah, absolutely. And that overlap is very rare that you'll have both. So it's like a lot of products aren't designed with service in mind, but the folks <laughs> in service... No, like they're like, why do they keep designing it this way? It's always a problem. Right. And then the people uh, who are designing it are like, I don't see the problem. Like it's just failing when it's supposed to fail. And it's like, well, it shouldn't fail because it actually causes this, you know, downstream failure mode that's bad for the customer. They're not fully thinking through the problem. Right. Right. And so it's like I came from the mindset originally of just fixing things. Mm-hmm. Right. And then I kind of went to the other side of designing things. And now there's this like weird crossover, which is nice. In a lot of ways, but not uh, as nice in others. But that's a good example of where you can see that in the real world. Talk to people yeah. who are fixing cars all the time as their job, and then look at the people who are designing them, and you'll see like just totally different mindsets and how they approach the same problem. Yeah, yeah. and that, that's a problem in like most industries too. Like yeah. I, I used to do construction, and like the people building the house hate the architects. They're like, <laughs> why did you design it this way? This is basically impossible to build for no reason. Yeah, but the architects are like, well, because it's it looks cool or it's like it's what the you know whatever like they design it for a reason that has nothing to do with building it like the yeah. same same type of thing but you know. yeah it seems like too because i see this with both of you guys <laughs> if, <laughs> if you the more you learn like the the proper way like the more it could kind of slow you down it makes so much sense because you're thinking about it this way or like oh technically you're supposed to do it this way but this way makes the most sense for me and like my situation. Like when Ethan goes to build something, he's like, what do I have in the backyard? This isn't the best way to do it, but I could do it today. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like (laughs) all these like kind of shortcuts. It's like the people who learned how to do it just on their own by fiddling. I feel like can get to a similar result faster. Yeah. I, I would say so for sure. And a big part of that too is 
I kind of look at that as like scrap veneering in yeah. some ways, kind of what I called it. Yeah. But fabric cobbling is another fabric good one. Oh, that's a good one. I love that. <laughs> yeah. The ability to like kind of like make that decision faster, I think is like definitely there. And I'd say that people who learn it more intuitively have maybe a little bit more of a creative aspect to it as well. Like right. they're using more of that creative part of the mind. It's more of an art form. There's not numbers associated with it. You're just yep. thinking. Exactly. Yeah. And when you kind of learn it in that proper way, like you're looking at it the same way as everyone else. And a lot of the, you know, great inventions and other parts of it are coming at it from a different point of view. And a lot of these people are doing something different in their industry than other folks. Like maybe they're, you know, in their spare time, they're, you know, an artist or doing painting or like something right. else on top of it. They have to kind of exercise both sides of your brain and pulling something out of the backyard requires you to be creative with your problem solving. And right. creative and problem solving is really, you know, I think what allows people to do it faster. And a lot of these people in the industry see as they become experts are also really fast. I have a few friends who are like really good at electronics now. And you just ask them a question. It's like they're fast, crazy, insane mm. knowledge there. And it's like partially them seeking knowledge to go with their creative engineering. So it's, it's a little mm. bit of both. Like, you know, learning as you go mm -hmm. and choosing to seek out the formulas and learning the vocabulary to operate within that space, I would say is, equally as important though. Mm -hmm. having enough knowledge to be able to look up the problem right you know like when i first started working on cars i was like oh the thing that sucks in fuel and air like that's my problem yeah right <laughs> yeah. and now you're like that's a carburetor right so now right. i can t type like oh my carburetor is running lean or like learning yeah, the absolutely. vocab is i would say like no matter who you are like is probably the most important part is learning how to communicate your problem to other people even kinda... learning the word on its own makes you think about the problem differently like yeah. I get this with like making music, even editing the videos. Like once you know what a certain type of sequence is called and you know that word and understand that word, you can think about it as in that specific problem. Otherwise right. it's like your head's kind of blurry. It's like, well, I know that it needs to do this, but how do I make it do that? But you learn the word and it's yeah. like you understand yeah. it instantly that much faster. It's, it's weird because I don't think you're getting any smarter. It's just you're accessing that part of your brain more easily once you learn the actual like word and actually understand like, oh, yeah. that principle. And I bet with like physical things like suspension and electrical engineering, it's probably even way more because even in like video editing and music, it's still very creative. Even if you learn the word, it's like it doesn't really mean anything until you make it something. Exactly. But like with suspension, it's like, oh, you change your acronym and it works better. Like that's a very physical you know, it's either going to work or not. Yeah. <laughs> like that's, yep. that's pretty cool. <laughs> Do you guys have like a favorite word you've learned related to like some, like, you know, like a mechanical or whatever? Like, I don't know. There's a lot of good ones. Like unsprung weight. I'm like, I like unsprung weight. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. 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 Like I just, or rather I should say I hate, wait. You yeah, no, hate I hate unsprung weight. Unsprung weight, yeah. unsprung weight is the nemesis. <laughs> like, I better not say that too loud or my dogs will freak out. They know the word nemesis. No. Yeah, <laughs> you should just teach them the word unsprung weight when they yeah. need to go attack something. so <laughs> Yeah. No, I mean, I don't know. It's, I wouldn't say that's my favorite, but that, that's what comes to mind. I don't know. It's just yeah. it's just a fun, like, it's, it's so <clears throat> important and integral to, like, building a car that works really well, especially off-road, is, like, your unsprung weight to sprung weight ratio and stuff like mm -hmm. all of that is like, yeah, it's just, and it's just, it's fun. It's I had another question about Tesla because I listened to, you know, all the Elon Musk interviews yeah. and all the ex Tesla employees that say this crazy thing or whatever. <laughs> I listened to, oh, no. Here's an ex Tesla Here's employee. An ex uh -oh. I listened to all that stuff. This is, this is pretty mild. I'm just, breaking the surface here but just like a little thing you said like you were in the van in the parking lot you're pulling all these all-nighters like we hear outside of tesla that that's kind of like the work culture and is really common and elon musk is a sleeping bag under his desk or whatever yeah like is that the work culture or do you think it's just like these people are passionate and they just want to make the best thing like what or is it even the majority of people who are doing doing that like sleeping in the parking lots or whatever and is there just a whole bunch of vans in the parking lot <laughs> that's also that a good question. Question. Well, there, there was a good article it's like you know tesla engineer lives in parking lot and it's like not me it's a different engineer and oh. i see my van in the background so <laughs> oh, no. that's hilarious uh, yeah i'm like i'm like the undercover one oh, okay. yeah. in the parking lot there but yeah. i would say you know you get a lot of young 20s folks who are just passionate to be honest like it's one of very few environments where like you know, even as an intern, you are given the responsibility of anybody else, the same 
you know, like I walked in as an intern and they were like, go design a system validation system for Model X or like make it work, run this thing. And you're like, uh, as what? an intern, you're like, eh. <laughs> you're like, you're like, I've never done this stuff before. And there's like, <laughs> like what, uh, there is a engineer there now and previous intern uh, who designed the Model S store handles. Like, well, they might not be perfect. They designed the whole thing from the ground up. Mechanical and electrical. As an intern? As an intern. There's one person. One person, yeah. I mean, he worked with some other folks too, but, uh, you know, to get it to production. But, like, he did a majority of that design, and it was really cool to see a lot of his prototypes and what else he had done there. But, you know, everyone there is given the same level of responsibility. And, like, what company are you going to walk into and be given the opportunity to just be treated like an adult? I, I mean, not just an adult, but just be treated like a human. Like, be given the opportunity to do a lot. Right. Well, right from the start and it's like it's very it makes you very passionate about your work and i loved every second of it until i think like after a certain point i'm like oh what's work-life balance i'd never heard of that before <laughs> <laughs> i thought work was where all the fun happened right. and it was true I, I i mean i loved every second of it so it's like yes in some ways like it is like there's an expectation to work nights and do this stuff but i was always the one volunteering to do that stuff because i was mm. like oh like oh i do that i don't have a girlfriend yeah. i don't date i don't have anything else tying me to anything else and once I started meeting more friends and doing other things, I was like, I need more of a balance. But as long as you're honest about that, like most managers there also like hear you and are like, okay. Like there was yeah. moments where I worked, you know, every weekend for months on end to get the vehicles out the door or do something in the factory or do something, you know, in the gigafactory or whatever. And I'd be like, hey, can I just take the week and, you know, work remote, you know, in uh, where I go, Puerto Rico. The boss was like, yeah, I don't care. Go for it. Like, yeah, you know, hmm. you need to break. That's fine. It won't even count towards your time off. So it's not like there's slave drivers. It's that the company is so cool and the products are so cool. People are volunteering to do that. A lot of times. I mean, some people, there is moments where that's definitely not true. Right. Okay. Where people like, are being driven to work more than they want to. Of course. And there's different levels of it. I think in the engineering department, there's a lot of passion around it. And I'm not sure how it's changed since I've left. But like, at least in that timeline in which I was there, there was a lot of volunteering and people doing it and also, a lot of the time, most people there are just single dudes, you know, <laughs> just being honest here. Yeah. And uh, it's, as a consequence, they're just like, yeah, this is great. This is cool. And I'm curious now, as those people have grown up more and have families and other stuff, half that culture has changed. I know that at mm. Rivian, that was a, one of the biggest differences was people being, I got to go home to my family. And I'm like, man, everyone here has kids. This is such a weird place. <laughs> <laughs> but it was like kind of cool, like people seeing that and caring, like, do you need time off? Like, what's your work life balance look like? And it was a, just a very different in terms of that part of the work culture. Right. Hmm. So it's, it's say like, just because everyone had that time, they used it, you know, everyone's just young guns, just going for right. it. Hmm. And is Elon pretty hands on? Like, was he looking at the stuff that you were making and being like, Oh, this is good. This is not good. Or uh, is sometimes there was moments when I was working like with him with direct decisions, specifically kind of around model X door demos and like some stuff around, um, you know, autopilot stuff that I'd worked on, um, a little bit, but, Overall, like, yeah, he's definitely very hands-on with the decisions that he cares about and sees impact in, and sometimes he'll get involved in, you know, some of your decisions, and he's not usually wrong, so that's yeah. kind of the thing that you learn. It's like, you can, as long as you know why you've made the decision you've made, there's no reason to be afraid of ever being in a meeting with him, because, like, he'll listen to it, for sure, and it's like, if you're, what you're doing makes sense, then it's great, like, as long as you cool. have the first principle knowledge to back up what you're saying, so this is kind of where that, like, intuitive versus logical stuff can get in the way, right, like, I made this decision because of my past, I've seen what works and doesn't work, mm -hmm. but it's like, from a physics standpoint, why does, why did I make my decision, right, and, and you have that, to know that to back it yeah, up, exactly, to to explain why it should, yeah, go into production, or yeah, and I think that's actually a good thing to kind of go back to once you start to make the decisions you make it's like why does this work right and getting some knowledge around that because it's very different than like learning how it works or sorry like teaching the first principle knowledge and then figuring out how to make it work right right like that can always work but it's more interesting i think to look at a problem and then why does this work right your first principles so definitely like not is i actually did enjoy working with him and around him. very intense but like you know at the same time i think is really excellent because he's always pushing people to do their best and he doesn't take crap. So, nice. you know. So you said Elon is intense though? Oh, of course. I mean, yeah, he's <laughs> super intense. Yeah, I mean. Seems pretty obvious. I mean, it's just like you walk up to someone like you can't, I mean, like you, you can't around. I mean, there's no way you're going to be able to lie or get away with something, hmm. right? And it's just really terrifying. Like, am I making this decision for a good reason? And it's very reasonable. Like, you're just going to lose your job if you're screwing, like if you're doing <clears throat> to be honest, like that's the best way of saying it. And it's no. like, 
I think that's totally fair. Like, right. yeah, if you're nervous for your job, are you doing your job? Right. To some extent, if you're no. confronted with that problem, like there's been moments where he's done illogical firing. You know, some people who are very good engineers who basically stepped in the way to protect their employees and got terminated as a consequence. And when those moments happen, it's like, yeah, he, his emotions got the better of him. And unfortunately, people lost their jobs, which sucks big time. But a majority of the time, it's not that way. It's logical. And it's very logical and thought out. Like, you know, you made this decision, but like, why? And if you don't know why you made that decision, then don't make it. Right. Mm. Like, or at yeah. least go up and ask other people, like, is this the right decision? Right. Like, there's no reason you need to make a decision in a vacuum. Right. So, yeah. Hmm. That's all. Awesome. Awesome. Does that apply to design decisions or just like what, like, what kind of decision would get you terminated? And like, I don't know, like if you're like making a door handle and you're like just got in the door and you like make it square and it's supposed to be an oval. Like, is that a termination situation? Probably not. And also a lot of that stuff is very hands on with Elon at the design. Okay. Studio. So he'll be reviewing all the design stuff, but let's say I'm trying to think of something that's not real so I can. Use yeah. 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 But, <laughs> um, <laughs> I think maybe a, a good one would be like, you know, you're looking at the manufacturing line, for instance, right? And then you have a robot doing this thing that like a human could do in 10 seconds. Oh, right? okay. So just and a robot might resources. take a lot longer. Like to program the robot will take you a year or you could get a teacher human to do it in a day. And it takes 10 seconds for the human to do it, one second for the robot to do it. Why would you make each decision, right? Right. And so it's like, if you can't really back it up, like, you know, during that whole push to automate a lot of it, there was a lot of over automation and people were really afraid of not automating things mm -hmm. instead of using humans to do a task they've always done. And I think that if you were like, oh, the robot needs to do it because automation. And you're like, well, why? Like yeah. clearly using a human here is much more efficient. We can no, work on the robot at the same time. Yeah. Why wouldn't we just use the human? Right. So if you couldn't back up that decision and understand why you made that decision. Right. That would be a good example of maybe something. I don't know if it would lead to a termination unless it was like a critical part to the car mm -hmm. and it was holding everything back and right. tensions are high. That yeah. sounds you fair know. to me. Yeah, that sounds yeah, super I mean, fair. Yeah. Because automation isn't a good enough reason, get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's to some extent that, or it could be something along the lines of, you know, like the drive unit, like someone notices like, oh man, we're going to like, the thing will fail after 10,000 miles because this one bearing decision, but we can't hold back things. And they don't tell Elon that that's, that that's happen, a problem that that's right. a problem and then it starts happening and they do and right. then, you know their manager's like oh I'll deal with it and never deals with it or something like that like that person becomes liable for that like it's if there's a problem that's going to impact the company like Elon wants to know directly it doesn't matter who's in the way so right. like there mm. should always be a path forward so that the solution can happen because okay. he'll drive it like if you're like hey this is a problem Elon is not going to fire anybody he's constantly just like alright what do we need to solve that problem and if you bring it up though without necessarily a path forward that can also get you in trouble so that's kind of where i oh. think that's kind of almost an issue oh, okay. like bringing the problem forward should be enough like you might not be able to make that decision that's why you're in that place in the first place mm. right you so. should be able to just bring it up and be like hey this is a problem i don't know how to solve it but here it is so, yeah exactly and not think that be your fault that it's it's a problem, a problem. Yeah. to begin with right so that there is mm. some issues where i've seen that happen but i have to say you know, majority of the time people sort of know a path forward. Like, hey, I think we need to look at other bearings or something, right? And right. It's like, okay, cool. Let's do that and let's do it quick because we are now going to be behind for this reason or another. So right. that's a really good example of people not bringing things forward because they're too nervous and then it becomes a problem. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah, I, I, guess yeah, I can yeah. see that <laughs> for yeah. sure. Yeah, 100%. That's like a tech, like big tech company problem overall, though. Like oh, I hear 100%, so yeah. many stories of things that people have been working on for a year for Microsoft or something, and then they bring it up and it just gets canceled in one meeting. Like, I hear stories like that all the time. And it's like, they're just so big and there's so many people working on so many things. And then it's like, if it doesn't go through, it just doesn't go through. And those people's years of work are just whoop, gone. gone. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure they learned things while building this particular package, but... Still, like, that's not very motivating work. But no. That's no. what makes me, it makes so much sense why so many people are culty around Tesla then if they're just, you're an intern just getting all this responsibility and your your work is actually going into the vehicle used by thousands and thousands oh, of crazy. people. It's very rewarding. That's yeah. really rewarding. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. And that's something that 
I mean, obviously the news focuses on the negative stuff, especially around EVs. <laughs> like, like fires. Everything. EVs yeah, just like get EVs attacked like so crazy and it's just, it doesn't make any sense. It's like... No, not really. <laughs> it, it, it really, it, it definitely doesn't make yeah. sense. Think if there was a huge news story every time a gas car caught on fire. It'd be crazy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, every single like, day. Yeah. 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 New shiny things always get the publicity, whether it's good or bad, yeah. right? unfortunately, right? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. especially like I remember all the bad news during the timeline. We'd all be watching it just being like, eh. Okay. It really didn't affect you after a certain point. You just keep working. Right? It's just like it is what it is. But, yeah. you know, I'd say that the politics in finances is something that's far worse than I think I ever would have known. So just mm. like, you know, a lot of that comes down to people, you know, shorting a stock and things like that. And yeah. Really pushing on it. Like it, it comes off weird the way Elon says it, but it's also really true. You see a lot of this crazy theories to push things certain ways or another. And it's just like, I have no idea where they came from. And like, it, it just doesn't make any sense. Uh, no. There's no logical reason to get it. It's that just place. fabricated to try to make the share price go down so people make money. That exactly. kind of thing. Yep, essentially. So Wow. But. It's going to be hard. You're just trying to build a car. <laughs> <laughs> it is very hard. What, this is the first automaker in uh, like 100 years to succeed, I think, to some extent. There used to yeah. be so many other automakers. Hudson. Um, oh, yeah. That's the only one I can think of. Studebaker, Packard, yeah. Packard yeah. Edsel. I mean, there's so many that have tried and failed. So, yeah. And it's an electric car company, which is like huge. Because yeah. there's a whole bunch of electric car companies popping up all the time. Oh, but yeah. they well, are now. But like yeah, there weren't there wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, no one, everyone thought building a car company was the craziest thing to do. And then it to was. build an <laughs> yeah. electric one, that's yeah. just insane. Uh, they yeah, set a new precedent, which is really cool yeah. because more competition is only going to make cars better and more efficient. Yeah, I mean, you look at how it's driven the industry. You see how yeah. people are like, you know, the, even the new Dodge 1500, like that giant touchscreen. It's like, hmm. Right. Mm. Yeah. 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 Where'd yeah. they get that idea? Gotcha. <laughs> yeah, and I think, it, especially during that timeline, the like mid, early 2000s, like what, 2000 and what, eight is when Tesla was founded? No, earlier maybe. I forget when it was founded, to be honest. But like that timeline was like 30, like think about the cars from 2004 to 2014. Yeah. It's just like, yeah. <laughs> They're missing most of the good parts. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> so it's kind of this like weird time when like things started to get too electronic, but then they tried to keep things too mechanical, and it's like this really awkward in between where like you lose all the human part. That yeah. makes it fun, yeah. Yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So. That's why all the cars before that era are so valuable. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> yeah, they have a mechanical. Yeah, yeah, yeah and aspect. reasonably so. It's like you know, I feel the same way. Like I think everything I own. Wow, I mean, everything I own is old. Yeah. So you don't own a Tesla? I had a Tesla, but it was cursed. That's the oh. best way to put it. And it was legitimately cursed. Like, <laughs> I'm like not superstitious. This week. <laughs> uh, no, more curse, for yeah, sure. More Definitely curse, more okay. curse. Like, every time I got it repaired, it would get in a crash. Oh, sure. Oh, oh no. Yeah, it was like I had it in the body shop five times, and then they lost the title, couldn't sell it, and then, like, a whole bunch of other really weird, mysterious things that happened with it that just, like, it wouldn't even go away. Even after I sold it, I got a random phone call. Just the service being like, you own this car? I'm like, no. And they're like, do you know anything about it? And I'm like, no. Also, like, why? This is very weird. Like, why is this being brought up? But it's just, like, kept coming back up. Like, no matter what <laughs> I did to escape it, it <laughs> you would show back up. And I'd be like, like that, uh, that old movie with the cursed car that, like, kills people. If, it seems Christine right, or yeah. whatever it is. I haven't seen it, but it feels yeah. familiar. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a movie about this car that's just, like, basically possessed by a demon or something, and it just goes around killing people, and, like, you can't kill it. Like, people crash it, set it on fire, and it just, like, comes back. Yeah, that it's car. Just, like, it's like a murder <laughs> car. Yeah. <laughs> just runs around killing yeah. people. Yeah. For anyone who was buying a car, don't buy a Model S with the last five ninety nine one one five. by the way. <laughs> <laughs> just make sure that before that's you get yourself a know. Model S. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe it's not cursed for you, but it's for me. So don't contact me if you have that car. <laughs> <laughs> so if um, if Tesla was so rewarding and such a cool environment, then why aren't you still there? Uh, ultimately, I think the best way to put it is that uh, things got too close for comfort between a friend of mine and their interaction with Tesla, mm. and uh, just didn't end up working out. So I was ultimately laid off for. Things that had happened, but ultimately at the end of the day, like I never did anything wrong. It's just like, you know, when you're a California employee or in many other states, you're an at-will employee and they can just terminate you for any reason. So oh, cool. oh. I didn't do anything ultimately wrong. There was things that uh, just weren't in line with what they felt were you know, best. Like, you know, I had a friend and he's like an exceptional, like, you know, if you think I'm anyway remotely knowledgeable to electronics or mechanical or anything, like, no, like he's leaps and bounds like more talented than I am and is, you know, a bit older as well. 
But that being said, he's extremely talented. He's been playing with Teslas like forever and has been in them and we were roommates and they thought I was selling him trade secrets, long story short, or like giving him knowledge and long story short, he he got it all on his own and he's super exceptional. I learned a lot from him. Right. So it was actually the opposite <laughs> it the side of it. Right? It's actually the opposite, yeah. Like so, you're taking the stuff that he learns and, and then back to Tesla. Back to Tesla. Yeah, yeah, it was right. easy. I mean, to be honest, I was like, yeah, of course. I'm like, wow, that's a cool idea. I should use that in my own tools and other things. But like, I also didn't tell them things that I had learned from him because, you know, he's a friend and other things too and I didn't see harm in other things. And I think part of maybe being maybe really knowledgeable in the technical side of it is like you don't see where there's a lot of gray area mm-hmm. right and you're like i don't know if it's right or wrong but it's like ultimately it's like a company right or wrong it's not like anyone getting hurt or legal right. things or no. associated with that and it just was too close for comfort for them and was right. ultimately laid off so i felt like it was kind of a matter of time before that would happen just like the more we were friends and you know we'd mm-hmm. been friends for a while but like you know we'd when they were close, particularly in those years. So you're kind of ready to move on anyways then? Yeah, I was already ready looking. I was kind of starting to look at leaving because I just felt like that he was doing a lot more work and helping a lot more people with their stuff. And as a consequence, like I think he was becoming more visual and I was like, mm, I just don't know what will happen with that. And like, mm. If it will track back to me in any bad way or and also yeah. just at the time I wanted more of a work-life balance I didn't want to be in California anymore and wanted to be closer to my grandma in New York and some other stuff so it was kind of already starting to happen I was on a, a half sabbatical when it happened I was working in New York mm-hmm. um but I was like out there temporarily for like a year to test things out and just didn't you know right. just got terminated while I was out there so what'd you do after that took a year off um did uh, helped uh, Simone Yetch, another YouTuber, build Truckla. That was a really fun yeah. time. So we did that with Rich, that thing. And Laura Kampf. That was Basi- cool. Basically, what I've learned is that all of the cool Tesla projects on YouTube Ryan has were secretly done by Ryan, basically. <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> not not entirely. But no, like definitely you not. Were, okay. You were like behind the scenes on, like, well, ours now, yeah. getting it going again. Rich's first tesla Dolores, you did a ton yeah. of work on that well, he, he did a majority of well work but you you helped him out with some very important yeah we, we went we took the battery part together like learned yeah. a lot about it together and i think it was like it was a super fun opportunity to freeze in his garage and like use a hair dryer <laughs> to stay alive it was great were you in the nice. videos i don't remember no that. at the time i was too paranoid to be in any videos oh, so okay like, you see i think my foot maybe in one shot. <laughs> but uh yeah he talks about some engineer who was like living in his garage that like broke down near him and that's probably me yeah. oh, okay so, <laughs> yeah, about this that being said i've learned that a hair dryer can fix a lot of high voltage components on cars fun mm-hmm. fact especially mm. i don't remember the maker of it i think it's like a conair or something like that. i mean that's like one of the major brands <laughs> it, it was something it? Like, but it was great it had like a dual switch for like one was temperature and one was fan speed and you could like stick it on the bus and change the resistance and it was like a high dynamic load and with the heat and like so the- basically like like a hair dryer is a variable resistor essentially and if you plugged it into the high voltage of the car since it's a resistive load voltage is somewhat not negated but the fact is you can just plug it in to some extent and we plugged it in line of what was the pre-charge resistor that blew up on that car and just like if i change the settings on it it would actually cause the car to turn on huh so it's really funny so it's like to get the car to work it would be like you'd like press the brake pedal and you know you hear the contactors turn on and this is like right before the contactor turns on it starts the pre-charge sequence to level out the buses and I remember you got once i got the hair dryer set and correct it was just like and then it would turn on you'd hear the blow dryer <laughs> come on awesome. hair dryer come on for a second and be like hey. that's funny because when our after we flooded our tesla yeah uh it would sometimes you know most of the time the contactors would not yeah. close and it would just be running off the 12 volt and then one time like right after we got it back, I was getting ready to take it off the trailer. Yeah. And the, we had the winch as a safety line hooked to the trailer just in case the straps broke. And I went to, to, to like loosen that up so I could detach it. And when I hit the button to power up the winch, that closed the contactors. Like the car, that extra draw uh, made the car like, do something I don't know, do something yeah. different where mm-hmm. it felt like it needed the extra voltage and it closed the contactors on the high voltage battery. And it actually drove for like five seconds but then I had to get out of the car to unhook the winch and it Dying then again, shut yeah. off and never turn on again until, you know, we actually fixed Your it. Your show. <laughs> but it's a similar thing where yeah. like an ex, like a totally different component that's not part of the car. Like, yeah. yeah. Well, the hairdryer thing was like, we basically replaced the res- part that was broken on the car with that. And with the hairdryer? Off. Yeah. That's amazing. It worked really that well. So amazing. I actually used to keep that hairdryer in my toolbox. Cause like, <laughs> it was, it worked so well. I fixed so many things with that hairdryer. We yeah, did like a number not? of projects where like we'd remove the front drive unit out of a car and, and we'd then like put the hairdryer. the hairdryer. Yeah. 
Because it replaces the load. Because like <laughs> essentially, like the bus is looking for this timing, and if you don't meet the timing of it, it won't turn on. So if we set the hair dryer to the right amount, we could set what? the timing. <laughs> so it was pretty funny. It was just a really random thing. Like we were like freezing. In the, I was using the hair dryer to stay warm because I w- couldn't stay in the house. And so I was like just in a sleeping bag and I had an extension cord out to the car and then the hair dryer in the sleeping bag and it was like snowing outside at Rich's place. The ultimate really, multi-purpose tool. It really was. It would keep <laughs> me warm during the night and then I'd use it as a tool during the day and then eventually it became part of the car so I couldn't use it at night. And mm. The car turned on at that point. So, yeah. <laughs> so was it was still part amazing. of the car then probably. Yeah, yeah. It was pretty funny. <laughs> this this reminds me of uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy where always you always bring a towel. You always bring a towel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The towel is always bring a hair dryer as the, the EV the EV. You know, version of that, yeah. <laughs> of a towel. Yeah. yeah, definitely. So, what other famous cars have you worked on then? Uh, there was a car from Racing Extinction that I worked on. I kind of did a rebuild on. That's about as all I can say about that project. Mm. Um, but I worked on it. About, nice. That's about all I can say. The, the new version, which most people probably haven't seen, it's a private owner that has it now. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. But I did a rebuild for them, and it's like fully automated. It's super awesome build. Hopefully, it sees the light of day one day. But that's cool. Yeah, that's awesome. That was cool. I didn't do. I mean, obviously, we've seen that new Tesla tank video. That looks pretty cool. Didn't do that. Yeah, <laughs> oh, I'm sure they'll call you. Just saying, it's a really cool video, and I wasn't a part of it. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. yeah, it makes. I saw that, and I was like, well. Our test was really lame now. <laughs> that thing was... Dude, sick. that thing's yeah. awesome. So cool. It's oh, better. it did spit out tracks like no one's business, it seems. Oh, yeah, no. Yeah, yeah. but it's awesome. So, yeah. so does everything. Like, yeah, even it's just tracks. Even, tracks um, just are tracks. Even rip saws, which have had, like, thousands of hours of engineering into them mm-hmm. and, like, countless prototypes and stuff, they still throw tracks all the time. Oh, yeah. Like, it's just... Anytime you try to make a track go really fast, it doesn't work. Yeah, just <laughs> is what <laughs> it is. Not for very long. Like, <laughs> yeah. It's just a, the, not the right apparatus for going fast no not really so how different was a uh, rivian besides i'm assuming after this you went to rivian or do you have another job first uh, what did i do also that year i also this is a busy year yeah i think ryan's just got a busy life yeah you're it's just like, like it gets crazier and crazier to be honest yeah. but like uh it was it started off with i had we were moving out me and the friend um we lost our spot in berkeley so I actually was living in new york I had to come back and kind of start moving out of there did truck lot you know, helped with Truckla during that timeline. And then uh, actually worked for Burning Man as an IT site manager. So doing nice. network infrastructure for them and stuff. And that was really nice to just out in the desert and like doing some electrical stuff, taking some like actual personal time for the first time ever where I wasn't working. It was the longest I mean, at that point. It had been many months. But it was nice to like not be like even have a schedule or anything. You just wake up, look at the dust and like a majority of the time. And then by the time the <laughs> festival rolls around, you're just like, who are all these people? Why are they in my desert? <laughs> and that's where you're going so like, tomorrow, right? Yeah, yeah. After, I'm going back to do it again this year as well. Yeah. Um, it might be my last year doing it. I feel like it's just such a time crunch, and there's so many other cool opportunities I really want to try over Everything's there, so. happening at the same time. Yeah, I right? wanted to do this thing called the Mongol Rally this year, and just didn't work oh, out. So yeah, you should tell them about that. You told me oh, about that. The Mongol Rally. Mongol rally. rally. So we need, basically, we need to we do it. Yeah, <laughs> we're, all, we're, we're all doing the Mongol Rally. It's like Gambler times a thousand, basically. What is the Mongol Rally? So, we're getting there. Okay, so basically the Mongol rally is you get the crappiest car you can, ideally under 1.2 liters, and you drive it from the United Kingdom <laughs> to Mongolia. Dude, that is <laughs> sick. Yeah. So it's like totally bonkers. And one of my favorite vehicles I've seen like in photos is like this like old classic mini. And they, you know, you're traveling that many miles. They gotta store stuff, parts, etc. Like, and they have a, a London phone booth welded to the roof of it. And it's used as like <laughs> a storage amazing. box. That is awesome. It's so quirky. Like it's totally in line with that. I wanted to go this year. I was going to do it with a friend. Didn't work out. And then also with you know, all the stuff going on in like Eastern Europe and stuff, like it got partially canceled. Like oh, the, the original yeah. you have to route. Go through Russia and stuff. Yeah. So the original route that most people take, they can't do. And Mong- Mongolia is still closed, land borders. So you can't even get through. Um, but um, they did like the, a new, different version the year, this year called the Poles of Inconvenience. And um, it's basically you're like driving around and there's all these inconvenient locations. You have to try and get a car. One was like in the middle of a lake. 
And so, oh, like, you know, and you have to like, go out there and get the checkpoint and like, you know, you have to be in your car to do to get the checkpoint. Yeah. Or yeah. half your car there. At I, least. I think they can you can still walk to get to it, but it's still very inconvenient. Like I've seen some photos of people walking up crazy mountains and all this stuff. And <laughs> it sounds like, like a great time. Oh, yeah, it just sounds like an exceptional time. I would have gone, but like I just like I that plus Burning Man back to back. And I was just like, yeah. I can't. That's I can't this year. And also just like felt it was too vague for me to jump into it. I'm like how did the polls work and all the stuff. And I think there was enough information there, but it was like written in this really sarcastic British humor, like the instructions. And I'm like, I don't know if you're telling me something that's useful or not. Right. Like, and I'm like, I need someone to interpret or, this. Like, yeah, 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 I needed a translator for that. And I was like, I don't know how to speak British English. Someone help. <laughs> <laughs> so I decided not to do this year, but I'm going to postpone. I think maybe till 2024, I think next year there's going to be some other cool opportunities, but I definitely want to do it. And it would be, so super fun. If you're supposed to do it in a car that's under 1.2 liters, does yeah. electric count? Because yes, zero it liters. does count. So someone did it in Nissan Leaf apparently. Mm. Like They're apparently also going to do. They just got approved. They're sponsored by Nissan to do uh, the doing the two poles. They're going to go from the North Pole to the South Pole now with that oh, with the Nissan, the Nissan Aria I think I don't know the exact name it's like a new electric SUV that they're producing mm. so wow. that's pretty cool I'm like dang I want to be on that journey yeah, yeah that for sounds sure. really That'd fun be super sick <laughs> so is there a price it. range or is it just like open it's, to anything it's supposed to just what? be like you know make it crappy I think it's supposed yeah. to be like under 500 pounds but um, like cost pounds by yeah. the way okay I was like British pound <laughs> yeah 500 <laughs> British pounds yeah. yeah like the gambler basically like. kind of like that but it's like you know there's always a big asterisk it's like make it crappy I think right. that's what you interpret by the 500 it's like you know things cost more these days everything else and it's like yeah, yeah. just get a crappy car and you know do it what you can with mm-hmm. it, essentially yeah. you know, have a good time and yeah. know that it's gonna break and make it fun <laughs> right so. what kind of stuff does Burning Man have that requires your skill set <laughs> I'm I mean, trying to think it's just a bunch of buses right. and fires in the desert, right? I mean, IT infrastructure for that is like, you know, the whole thing runs on Google spreadsheets. So it's like you got to oh. have internet to make, you know, do the ticketing, get people in and out, security. And like there's a bunch oh. of things that require like knowledge, like, you know, who's where and when, like how is food doing done for the staff? Like there's a lot of stuff in the medical tents and like the EMS. And all of that has to have, all of that has to have internet that works, right? Mm. Or else the whole thing goes down. And there's just a lot of going on. It doesn't seem that crazy, but with so many people in such a remote location, it's really difficult yeah. to do a lot of that stuff. And How many people? I think it's like 80,000, 50 so to 80,000. you have to make internet reliable. Well, not for all them. They don't get internet, by the way. Oh, okay. We do, we do what's called a community Wi-Fi, where like people can bring their own node and they can get on our Wi-Fi, but they're limited bandwidth. So it's like, the okay. idea is like, you can get on and check your email and make important calls yeah. and stuff, but like we, you know, you're not uploading photos to Facebook and all that stuff. But you're doing this in the middle of the desert. Yeah. So how do you, I guess you just have a bunch of generators and how do you go about doing that? So yeah, basically like a, put up a bunch of like radio towers in the desert and they all have different links back to different locations. So they have like microwave dishes that point back to the little town of Gerlach there, which will then point dishes and bounce them off mountaintops to Reno. And then there used to be a link, I think, all the way up to Colorado. And wow. so like with wow. the that bounce all these mountains. But I don't remember exactly where the other link went. I could be wrong. Huh. But uh, yeah, it's just like essentially you're bouncing all these different links. You need redundancy and like all this. And I'm curious to see this year because I mean, last time there was an official burn, there wasn't Starlink. So right this oh. year, I, you can imagine so many camps bringing out their own Starlink dishes yeah. and stuff. But that being said, you know, it's designed to be portable, but I don't think it's designed to have that high of a concentration. Right, that, yeah. the network's just gonna be super <laughs> overloaded. Like that many Starlinks all in one little place. Like yeah. it, no one's going to have any bandwidth. Probably. It's very curious to see how it works. Yeah. I'm wondering because, you know, I know Elon goes to Burning Man. I saw his art car a few years ago. <laughs> nice. Really? That's, uh, that's yeah. cool. Awesome. Yeah. I like saw him. I'm like, Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> there he is. Cool. That's Fun funny. Time. I ran into one of his security guys that I knew pretty well. I was like, Oh, Hey, what's up? You know, I'm not going to say his name, but well, right. <laughs> yeah. But he was just like, it was pretty funny. He was like, after I was like going, I'm like, you know, wearing some crazy outfit. He's just like, going on here because yeah, <laughs> we both know each other it was pretty funny <laughs> that's awesome that's hilarious. but um yeah it's it's pretty it'll be pretty crazy this year to see how that works out because yeah. yeah it's just i think the starlink aspect will also be really interesting if and how it plays yeah. out what's it like i've heard i listened to a podcast with the guy who like started it with his group of friends mm-hmm. and like he says like they don't even go anymore because it's so big is Thanks. it like yeah. like it, it sounds like you've been going for like a while a so years. is it getting like worse or is it awesome it depends what you want out of it (laughs) what it comes down to it's like if it's i think a lot of people go to it as like a music festival Mm -hmm. and i don't 
I don't consider the music to be the, any remote reason why I go. Like the reason I go is like, there's so many amazing artists who build large scale projects and that there's like really cool. a lot of things yeah. around these like narratives. I think is the best way of putting it. Like people will like design a shtick, the shticks everywhere. That's the best way to put it. So like you walk in, you're like, Oh, I'd like a coffee. Like there's places that give out coffee, but it's like, it's hard to get a coffee. You have to tell them a story. Or like, or you have to tell them a joke. And if they don't laugh at the joke, you don't get the coffee. What? So it's like you go looking around trying to find good jokes and like learn a joke. And then you come back and it's like, you're always trying to do it, trying to get the coffee or like the grilled cheese. Like I'm always going, for, there's so many food things that it's just like, yeah, my favorite, one of my key favorite moments there was some guy showing up on like a trike with a brand new wolf griddle on the back of his bicycle, like cooking grilled cheeses. Mm. And it was a really good grilled cheese. Like 3 a.m., <laughs> guy rolls around and it's just like, He's just like, would you like a grilled cheese? That was a great conversation. I'm like, yes, of course. And it was just delicious. Like, guy knew how to make a grilled cheese, too. And you were telling me about that, uh, the the thing where they had, they were, like, fishing with trash. They were oh, catching people. Yeah. Like, they had fishing poles with a piece of trash on the end. They, like, cast it out into the desert and reel in a person. Yeah. Because it's <laughs> one of the best parts of Burning Man, too, is, like, people pick up their trash. And people who don't are people from music festivals. Mm, like, you go, mm, like, you see photos of music festivals, you look at the ground, and yeah, those photos it's covered. disgusting. Yeah. And yeah. the burn and the principles behind a burn, no matter where, if it's the big one or a regional burn, is, like, there's ten principles. I don't have them memorized, unfortunately, but for this context. But, like, one of them is, like, pack in, pack out kind of thing. And right. people are very prominent about especially at the big brand like you see trash people pick it up and they'll like sometimes fight over it it's pretty funny <laughs> so it's like in my that trash case, in the case of like the fishing one i remember going out there i'm like oh piece of trash like picked it up and then i'm like well it's on a fishing line and i like, followed it and at the end of it was you know people on this fake dock they built out in the middle of the desert <laughs> and then, like awesome. you know and they just like they like fed you a gummy worm <laughs> you know? and they're just like great and then they throw the trash back out again and like you know pick another person and do it again so it's That's amazing. out there they call trash moop which is matter out of place matter out of place mm. nice yeah yeah, so there's like a bunch of like amazing parts to it. For me, it's the art, it's the shticks, it's like you know they have this place called Hangtown where they have a 360 swing where you can like go and like just go over and over and over. I did it it's like amazing. 50 times in a row and like feel like I almost blew up all my muscles in my body. It's amazing. <laughs> so <laughs> is it like are the chains of the swing like rigid poles? Yeah, so you rigid can't, poles. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so yeah. it just goes. Oh, wee. So it's like a trapeze one. Yeah. Is but it it's on really a motor cool. or you? No, you. It's pump. all human powered. It's all. Oh. So you just keep going until you until you get all the way around. Yeah, and like most people don't get around it, but like when you get going, you get going, and like you don't realize <laughs> how much power it takes to like push through the other side of that. Yeah. Especially once you start cranking, you're just like, oh my gosh. Like, I was so fun. I couldn't walk for, like, three days, though. It's not the best move. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it was great. I just remember just napping in some hammocks, and I, like, look over and saw this thing. I'm like, oh, that looks fun. So it's like all that little stuff is great. There's no monetary exchange. It's just people, like, just chatting and giving and wanting to connect a lot of them. And then there's a lot of people out there we call the sparkle ponies or the people that are, you know, wearing glitter and being really moopy and they're trashy, like, just trash sparkle everywhere. Ponies. Yeah, like and they're that. just, like, doing a crap ton of drugs and just, like, they're like totally useless. I'm just sorry, but it's just the truth. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, they're not giving back. They're not giving to the community. Adults. They're, they're not helping takers, anyone, yeah. right? And I'd say that like that number of those types of people has definitely increased, but there's still so much to the core of what is Burning Man. I'm very curious to see how it is this year because it's the uh, first year back since the pandemic. Right. So it'll be really mm. interesting to see. There's been mm. some renegade burns. I didn't make it to any of those. I heard those are really good and closer to what the origins of Burning Man like. Were unofficial ones or whatever yeah kind of out there and i heard those were pretty good so i'm curious to see kind of what the big burn is this year i know that the organization itself is making some changes too to allow people to build out in the city like out in gerlach and like do more artists and installations year around and bring mm. presence to that because like there's a lot of good things in what they do but they only seem to exist for a week so right now. hopefully the organization expands and hmm. it makes that more of a year-around thing and their impact to the community in yeah. which they you know call home that's part of the the cool part of it though, right? Is like a lot of people put like a year into this crazy thing. If people enjoy it for a week and then they burn it. That's like the whole point, right? Yeah. Some, Wait, so they burn the art? They burn not, a, not all of it. Yeah, there's some art that is burned, but there's always ah. some really crazy big stuff. Like there's a one of the coolest ones was the Folly. The Foley, I can't say it correctly, but like it was the year I was out there and it was this like whole little like it looks like a something you'd see out of like a storybook like a sailing town and there was like all these rope bridges and like Whoa. like Whoa. nicks and like buildings and ladders and like this crazy thing what? all built out of wood and like one of the coolest things is like there was these little holes in the wall and you see light coming out of them and you're like, what are these little holes and i mean like quarter inch yeah. holes like tiny you go up and you'd like look inside the hole and someone built an entire like three-dimensional like 
art installation inside that hole. It's like this big. And like one of them was like a tiny abandoned warehouse with all these plants and everything. Like inside, inside, of this, inside, hole. inside this little hole. Like you look in there and it's like <laughs> all these little tiny details. I'm like, what is going on? And I remember seeing it and all of a sudden this little like gnat or bug like landed inside the set of it, like just randomly. Oh. And like you see it and I'm like, oh my God, there's like this giant creature like <laughs> trying to like crawl through the rafters of this warehouse. And it's just like, they're huge. <laughs> in this <laughs> tiny little scene and it was like one of the coolest little magical moments because everyone's looking at the big picture and all these things and I'm just like oh what's a little light in the wall that's weird yeah. yeah. and then you're like looking at it and like everywhere you looked there was something new to be that's seen amazing. and it was like just one of the most beautiful installations well thought out they did classical music there all the time which is like out there considering the sheer quantity of EDM bumping all the time mm-hmm. like hearing live instruments was like just one of the best parts of right. that yeah that sounds wow. wicked cool yeah that's some really <laughs> cool stuff and I think like the music and the like, people consuming drugs and doing all that stuff out there kind of takes a large. Well, a lot of people know about it. Yeah, yeah, the crazy outfits. Right. But there's like all these art installations and experiences and things out there that you don't hear as much about, which are really what keep people there. But also, what you don't hear about because people don't share on Instagram and all that because it's not part of it. Right. right? That's yeah. what you, it's like. There's no when you're out there, your phone should be gone. Like maybe you're taking a Polaroid and you're giving it to someone as a gift. That's cool. But like you know, part of it is living in the experience and in that moment. Right. That's cool. So we met Ryan at KOH, which most people call Redneck Burning Man. Yeah. So you've been to both. Like, yeah. what's your what's your take on like I don't know? They're, they're totally unrelated in in uh, most ways, but like I don't know. Just what's your thoughts on like yeah, both yeah. of them as as events? Just as events, know, and that's like, uh, King of the Hammers, yeah, yeah, which is one of the know. most crazy off road races in the I states. Think, I think it's the largest, it is the like, craziest place, I've the ever largest off road. Off road, I have no idea actually. Uh, I mean, as far as spectators and other things, like maybe as like a not closed event in that context, because Baja 1000 is huge, but it's just right scattered spread out over the whole. So I don't know. I don't know. It's huge. It's It's huge. It's like the same size. Yeah, it's like fifty thousand plus people. The eighty thousand. I don't know. Like they also have so many people coming in for the day. It's fairly accessible in comparison. Right. You know, it's cheaper. It's twenty bucks for a ticket or something. Forty bucks for a ticket. I know it's cheap. I think it's forty. Yeah, Yeah, it's pretty cheap. Just put your giant, massive off-road event with a bunch of trucks and vendors in the middle of the desert. Yeah. Yeah. Just for people who haven't heard of King of the Hammers. Yeah. 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 Anyways, (laughs) I digress. I mean. Also a great event. Super crazy. I've been going since high school. So my high school auto shop used to build King of the Hammers trucks. That's what we did in auto shops. That's Which is so the coolest cool. thing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, talk about, I mean, that's basically how I got into cars, you know, like right. awesome auto shop teacher. Shout out to Joe Silva. Best auto shop teacher ever. Also like definitely an important person in my life. That's cool. Um, yeah. Super good guy. Um, but it's a super crazy event. Definitely similar in some ways. You basically have a ton of people partying in the desert as like a high level, but there's no arch sticks or any of that. No. And it's just, you know, <laughs> there are smudge bots. Yes, there's I mean, smudge bots. Yes, that'll work. Uh, there's a lot of people just hanging out, shooting the shit, and like drinking beer and hanging out, and that, that's a good time for sure in its own way. But it, like, I think there would be really cool to see more, like people drawing in more of experiences in other ways. Yeah, like, more out there creativity part of it. maybe. Or... Yeah, like I mean, the thing it's like racing is a big part of it, but you could have like maybe do like an RC car race and some other stuff yeah. and like have like more just like activities going yeah. on for no. other people while you're there like there's all so many different races there's so much going on and i think that in some ways it's hard to catch different parts of the races yeah. and like there could be more interactability like there's all these things that i see coming from the burning man standpoint where like, right. you could do but it's like is that a race i don't know yeah you know <laughs> i think it's just a something that could be done right. i don't necessarily think it might be right for that event and one of the things that um, I like specifically what Burning Man is a lack of monetary exchange once you're there. It's like about giving and gifting and all of that. And there's a lot of people give stuff there and all that, but it's like you go to the vendors and it's like there's food and there's things like that, but you're always waiting in line and it's this thing. And it's like, it's not, you know, being sustainable to yourself or others around you. It's just very like typical event. And that being said, they're much better about picking up trash and things there than I've seen at most music festivals even. Right. Like they yeah, spend yeah. a ton of time, you know, at the end of the event you know, running all the trails again, picking up all the trash. Like you look at the desert after KOH and it's clean. Like That's, considering yeah. how many people how many, were there, yeah. it's like, yeah. I was out there last week actually um, doing some stuff. And it was like, just like you look at everything, you would never know there was a giant race there. Yeah. It's pretty impressive what they can do. Yeah, no, I, I, I would, I would agree about like, they could do a lot more of making it a more, I don't know, just a more interesting event for everyone because the race is really cool. But it's imp- uh, impossible to see most of it. Like, you can see, like, one little bit of it, and then you wait three hours, and then they come, tr- come through again. Yeah. You know, like, it's just such a huge race that it's really, really hard to see any amount of it. And so, like, a lot of the time is just spent kind of wandering around, like, with nothing really to do. Yeah. I mean, 
people bring their own buggies and stuff and go. If you do that, it's that. great. Bring yeah. your own dirt bike, bring your own toys. It's, yeah, it's yeah. a grand old time. It's a great place to go riding. Yeah. But like, if you don't have that, there's like uh, the RC thing would be cool. You know, like for something, you something, know? something small and contained or like maybe more short course stuff where yeah. everybody can get see around it. Like they do have a short course, but they don't really they don't utilize it do during the races. races. Yeah. yeah. So but yeah, that like, said it was a really fun. There's a lot of opportunity yeah. to do a lot of really creative things there. That being said, like, you know, I mean, I think Joe, you know, almost every year since we've gone, like he hasn't built a truck in a long time, but he watches it most of the time at home via the live stream. Like they've done an amazing, as far as races go and coverage, Oh yeah, the the live stream crazy. coverage is it's phenomenal. Yeah, so, they have aerial footage, yeah. ground footage. It's, it's like some in car stuff every mm-hmm. once in a while, and it's just like it's that's phenomenal. Amazing. Like that's the thing. Like I don't even have to go to the desert to enjoy King of right. the Hammers. Like I can watch it on my screen at home and be you know eating nachos. See more of the race. You really do if you were yeah, there. Yeah, and yeah. like when I'm there, you see so many people around the jumbotrons. I think that's something they've done to, to help yep. with that. Is like some key spectator areas. They'll have the jumbotrons there so you can enjoy it in that context. So I right. think that's something great that they've done. Um, definitely in that context. So. One, of, one of my personal ideas to uh, bring some hilarity to King of the Hammers is uh, King of the Hummers. Have Humvee spec racing there, like a short course. Like, oh, that'd be hilarious. Bring a bunch of retired military Humvees and just bash them around. They're yeah. all the same, but like, I don't mm-hmm. know. Dude. They did the Class uh, 11 race this year, which is really cool. What was the class The stock Volkswagen Bug class. At KOH? Yeah, really? Yeah. really? Yeah. And one of the nights was the Class 11 uh, race they had all the stock Volkswagens running the short yeah. course and they were doing the rock some rock stuff it was really hilarious. Dude, class 11 That's I didn't awesome. know they did it at KOH but I've, I've seen like Baja yeah. uh, Baja 250 class 11 is insane yeah those people are hardcore it's, like, I've got nothing <laughs> on them yeah it's literally a stock Volkswagen Beetle like old Beetle air cooled and you're not allowed to make any like changes to the engine or suspension. Yeah, like you I can think you a, can do a little bit on suspension, but, but like, it's like just it's shocks. Like shocks. You can't go yeah. long travel. You yeah, can get yeah, like yeah, better yeah. shocks, better tires, skid plates, roll cage. <laughs> sounds brutal. And that you can like rebuild your engine. Absolutely you ridiculous. You can't like go big bore on the engine. You can't yeah. like just it, it's just a beetle. And what? you see him go over the whoops. The trophy trucks are floating level across yeah. an and they're like bam, and they're going bam, like this, doo, 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 <laughs> just like oh. bouncing, literally just they, yeah. not like rolling over it like this. They're just like yeah. If you want to see someone who's a good forward. yeah, if you want to know who's a good racer, get them in a class eleven. Yeah, that's how you know because it's like you need to know your environment. You can't just power through it. It's right. about like knowing your vehicle, knowing the environment, and knowing how to utilize it to the maximum ability yeah. for sure. And they do the Baja One Thousand in those a thousand Ooh. miles. Yeah, it's of they, that. what? Yeah, they're they have like ten spine. drivers for that for sure. It's yeah. so many driver swaps. <laughs> yeah. like fully compressed spines at the end. They just need to hang upside down for like yeah. three weeks. I think they have racing. the option of running like suspension seats and other stuff. Oh, okay, <laughs> to, save, to make them your butt. Yeah. Yeah, you know, like in every other part. It of doesn't make the car better. It just makes you not die. So you just keep the basically a stock drivetrain, yeah. and you can yeah. modify the vehicle around it. Mm. Well, not even that, really. Yeah. Like even it's, it's even a stock, too. even the oh. fenders yeah. are on it. Fenders you have, have to, to keep be. the fenders yeah. on. Yeah. Yeah. Oh no! Yeah, like, I don't think you can even cut them. Yeah, you can't cut them. They Dude. fall off during the race, and that's fine. But right. like, you know, like it has to start the race as a stock bug. Yeah, wow. and they're not like fiberglass fenders either. It's all they're, still yeah, the metal. steel. Yeah, and, yeah it's, it's, it's ridiculous. It's hilarious. That was such so fun to watch that race. So they did a yeah. bunch of little races. They did like a UTV short course race, a few other yeah. things. They, yeah, coming from someone who really understands this stuff, how far away do you think we are from electric race trucks being competitive with gas trucks? I guess in what context? Like how are we talking endurance? We're talking short course, like like King of the Hammers type stuff, like going through the desert over crazy rocks for like, what is it? A hundred miles or something? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think between pits and battery swapping and a lot of stuff, I think we're not that far out. I think that the technology is all there. It's about the integration Mm -hmm. and bringing it together into the right situation. I think there's going to be a lot of people learn. I think we're probably, probably a year from seeing the first ones trying to compete. And we're probably three years from seeing enough of them competing with each other and about five years from like truly, you know, on par. Because they're, in some ways. Mm. they're creating a spec class for KOH, KOH this yeah. year, or for ultra foreign in, in general, right? Yeah. For, well, I don't know if it's ultra foreign, at least KOH. At least KOH. At least KOH, yeah. KOH, yeah. So the EV spec class is, um, yeah, it's a drivetrain kind of put together with Dana in conjunction with Hypercraft as like the lead integrator for that to kind of bring that together. So. Um, that'll be pretty cool. Actually. I'm excited to see that. Like I think working with that drivetrain specifically, there's a lot of things that can be done and 
I wouldn't particularly pick that drivetrain to like build something on my own, but the fact that everyone has the same thing, yeah. we'll get it started. Just like I think Formula, not Formula E, Formula E is obviously great, but uh, Extreme E um, looks really cool. I think that's like a really interesting is that the, a spec class too. Is that the rally? The it's like a Dakar rally? style yeah. thing, mm-hmm. yeah. I'm like, how do I get on one of those teams? Yeah. That one, yeah. that, maybe yeah. that's my next job. So if you're out there, let me know. <laughs> do you think that plug-in hybrids have a place in off-road racing or do you think it's going to be one or the other for a long time i think i mean there might be a spot where hybrids exist the problem is they're impossible to classify yeah. and That's they're very kind of issue yeah heavy. because like in formula one the the battery packs make it so much more interesting to watch because they're racing around racing around and they like do certain things to charge their battery yeah. more like break differently and it's like this balance between battery gasoline and saving your tires yeah and then when you're ready to discharge that extra power it makes the cars able to like race each other so much more competitively and it's so cool and it's been in formula one for a minute but i haven't really seen any other racing that has fully adapted the hybrid yeah. it seems like they're either all gas or all, all electric. electric that makes sense yeah, yeah. i mean I think hybrid would be great. I just haven't seen any class in the off-road world that's really done it yet, and I think there's definitely a lot of opportunity for it, right. for sure. Yeah, I think not? it'll be primarily more electric uh, in that context. Or, I mean, it'd be interesting to see some Formula One tech in that context kind of, like, bleed into it. And, I think it would be so cool. Oh, I think it'd be really cool. Because there's so many things, like, even in King of the Hammers, like, where you're just romping down, like, downhill, and every time you hit the brakes, you're just getting a little extra juice, and you need to yeah. carry less gas, and yeah, you have the weight of the batteries and all this stuff. Well, but that keeps you more planted. You yeah, know, mm-hmm. and you can put, a, put it down low. Keep yeah. your CG low, yeah. So you Something. think the technology is pretty much already there, there just lacks a racing division to actually explore. Yes. And it's expensive. As oh, yeah. yeah. That's yeah, a that, big part. Off-road racing is a lot. It's expensive. But Formula yeah. One's most expensive. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there's not as much money going into off-road racing as yeah. far as like sponsors and like like Formula One drivers make insane money. Like most people who do off-road racing lose money. Yes, right. like, if you make money off-road racing, then you probably are not telling anybody about it because right. you're the only one. <laughs> yeah, no one makes money off-road racing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, or you own a brand or something, and it's just bringing enough attention to your brand. To, yeah. like, you're still not to making money off that racing. Cop- you're no. just yeah. using it as a write-off to like to sell more your t-shirts business. or yeah. whatever. Yeah. 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 That being said, I mean, like I, I think that King of the Hammers and its live stream, it's like getting more and more views every year. It's such an interesting thing to watch. That right. Um, I think if Score and other you know, off-road divisions really get their live streaming and know how to, like, Formula One is a business, you Mm -hmm. know, it is not a racing division, it's a business, like, you look at Drive to Survive, like, I wasn't into Formula One until Drive to Survive from Netflix, like, that was so cool to see behind the scenes, like, what are the drivers up to in the off-season and things like that, I'm like, oh, I'm way more engaged, I actually want to watch Formula One, I'm like, (laughs) rooting for so many different people, I'm like, oh, I love your personality, you know, it's like, all these crazy people, so it's like, I think if there's more of that with score and off-road racing and things like that, like, A, I think off-road i mean formula one's pretty global but it's mostly european and stuff but what's pretty cool about off-road is its involvement with mexico and i think they might do more things with like you know southern america and other things like that in the future and it would be cool to see a lot more of these cultures like seen as like a presence like within the racing and like tell more stories around it as well there's like a lot of opportunity to really bring a much bigger audience in off-road racing than there currently is if they did a drive to survive on king of the hammers Oh, that would, that be, would be an amazing show. That would be so good. So, awesome. good. so yeah. many characters out there in the desert and people who just live and breathe King of the Hammers. Yeah. Like, it's all they care like about. Our friend Kyle that we met at um, yeah. Holly High Voltage, yeah. he, he was the first to do it in anything electric. I know. And he's just a really cool dude. And oh, he's he so cool. just loves KOH. Like, yeah. that is his... It's what he lives for. Like, yeah. That's it. He's yeah. like, this is my thing. Like, mm-hmm. this is my place. This is my people. Yeah. This is what I do. And yeah. he's just such a cool dude. Well, he's inspired so many people, too, by doing that. Like, I'm, yeah. I'm only mad at him because he beat me to the punch to getting a car out there. So, <laughs> yeah. so screw you, Kyle, but at the same time, good on you. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate it that you're doing it because, like, now I'm getting off my ass. So, yeah. um, Well, if Rivian didn't take so long to make a car, you might have been out there with him. Mom. That's true. I would have. I thought about, I've been talking about bringing my stock Rivian to KOH just on portals. So that'd be kind of fun. We'll see. We'll see. I don't know. It's an expensive, yeah. uh, expensive it's an, loss. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's unlikely to survive. Yeah. Drive race. to not survive that one. Yeah. So we'll see. <laughs> that's what they could call the Netflix show. That's, that's drive, another drive without yeah, survive. That's another interesting thing about KOH is how many people just don't make it at all. Oh yeah. I mean, like, I forget how much actually finishes the race. It's very small. Many. Amount. Yeah. 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 It's, it's not. Yeah. More and more every year for sure. Right, but yeah, like, everybody I remember when we were racing, it was 
very few finished. Yeah, we didn't finish either year. You you raced KOH? Well, the, we, the, the, the high school team. Oh, the high school team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the first year was a DNF due to, is that when we were vapor locking? I think we were vapor locking the fuel pump. And the second mm. year was uh, the toolbox like came out and cut through the harness. and they spent, <laughs> Oh. Like, so oh. They, had, they finished, but, you know, five hours after the finish yeah. line closed. Yeah. So. Well, King of the Hammers is one of the only races I know of where it's, you know, obviously the first, second, third, you know, it's people who get across the finish line. But then also placing goes how far you make it. So like even if you don't finish, you still place higher than someone that didn't finish less distance than you. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. like, <laughs> yeah, like you might have a class where no one. Well, for example, EV class. I mean, it was just Kyle. Yeah. yeah. But like, if there'd been someone else, it would have been a competition to see who made it farther, not who actually finished. So after Rivian and Tesla and everything, what are you doing now? Because it's pretty I mean, awesome. You had the time to just come up here and hang out with us and yeah. have some fun. I mean, most people don't. If they're on a career trajectory like that, most people don't, you know, it seems like you're just led by passion, which is yeah, really cool. Yeah, 100% by passion. Like, it's like, it's, I think that's probably the most important thing that I've learned. It's like, if you're not enjoying what you're doing, don't be doing it. I mean, that being, that's totally not true also in the other context, which is like, you got to suffer a little. Yeah. yeah. You got to <laughs> fail, you got to learn, and you got to move on, right? Yeah, so. if it gets a little hard, you don't just give up. Because yeah, it's like, I don't hard. like this. It's like, you know, I don't like doing my taxes, but I also don't like the IRS coming down <laughs> on me either. So <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> I probably should still do it. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, I, I'd say that's definitely true. Like, right now, it's been weird. Year. I've been doing an internet install for the set design shop in New York. I did Macy's Christmas display windows, did animatronics for that, like, for the winter. That was really weird. <laughs> that's funny. Um, yeah, I made some moving clouds and some, like, crazy reindeer. And it was, like, that was not something I was expecting to do, but kind of <laughs> it happened, like, that right after Rivian just offered out of nowhere. Like, okay. okay. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I'm kind of looking for that next thing. I'm doing consulting right now and just, like, you know, folks like you guys and other fo people like that, like I like teaching other people about EVs and inspiring them to do more with them. So yeah. like just would love to actually do more creative stuff, work with other channels and yeah. like have that opportunity, I think is kind of actually what I'm hoping for this next year is more consulting and then more of these creative, fun EV developments to kind of get back to that creative sense of it. Right? Right. Like I've been doing so much of this logical first principle backup. I want to get back to this like. I have an idea. Let's play with it. Yeah. Kind of ideas and like building cool, cool stuff. And well, so, I mean, have you thought works. about doing your own channel? It'd be epic. I would love to. I just need to learn how to edit and also mm -hmm. like be in front of a camera. I mean, there's a, I have probably a hundred hours of video that I've recorded um, just on my own to try and put together. And it's like, I can't look at myself on camera. Yeah. yeah. You should That's get an like, editor. I, yeah. I it's, mean, yeah. it's one of those things that it takes so much time to do well that, I think just starting with an editor right off the bat is the move, but definitely like still watch the footage because you learn so much about the way that you film and like what parts you use and don't use. Even you just watch your editor edit. Yeah. Oh, you for know? sure. I mean, I, I would love, like, I think editing would be fun, but I also learned that there's, I have a hard time sitting down with it because it's such a new skill. Like I really just need to dedicate time to it. And it's like mm -hmm. this year has been full of like fun moments and then other things like that have taken my time and energy away to like, I'm yeah. like, Oh, like you know, I spend most of my time like bouldering like in New York right now. And I'm like, that's way more important than editing right now. Cause like, yeah. my physical <laughs> oh, health and sure. mental health goes so right. like, yeah. much together that like, it's yeah. been nice to actually dedicate time to that. But that being said, yeah. like hundred percent, I think it'd be fun to make a channel and do stuff. I need to like work on that, like camera presence and some of that other stuff. But I also think it'd be cool as like the focus of that channel one or more channels even to like focus on collaborating with other channels. It's yeah. I mean, it's, it's it. a, yeah, that's a really like important thing that we've done a little bit here and there. We've been doing more of it recently and it's, it's just, it's better to just collaborate. Like even from like a just motivation and inspiration standpoint, like oh, it's okay. just so much more inspiring to like go work with someone and learn how they do their things. And then like, just, just work together on projects. A hundred percent. Yeah. When uh, we came yeah. back from donut media, we were like really inspired to take things to the next level and yeah. change up our workflow a little bit and stuff like that. Cause we were like, there's a lot of things that are, too big about donuts. Oh, yeah. Never it's replicate. Like 30 employees. <laughs> wow. Yeah. yeah. I ridiculous. didn't know that. Oh, it's yeah. intense. Huge. Yeah. It's huge, it's like an, it's an industry. It's not like. How big yeah. is Hoonigan? I have no Bigger. Huge. Yeah, I was going to say, it's huge. Oh, I'm, I'm very curious giant. how big not, as a brand they've gotten. Like, it's, uh, it's insane. insane. They're more of a brand than a chant. Like, I mean, they're a they're channel. They're production. But they're more of a, like, donut is more of like a media company. 
and and Hoonigan is more of a merch company that also Mirror does tracing and like a bunch yeah. of other things. Like but that. I have no idea. Their yeah. their warehouse is huge. I can imagine. They have a whole built room that's like bigger than the new shop I'm going to build here. For just merch. full of merch and people shipping and packing it. So like they have to have way more than 30 employees. That's I have insane, no idea, yeah. but it's insane. No. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot to learn from like both. Right. But we're more driven by just building the things we want to build and telling the stories we want to tell yeah. Being creative, than we like, are about yeah. trying to take over yeah. or make more money or, oh, yeah. Yeah. you and know, that's... like I'd rather do something that I'm really passionate about and make videos that I'm really proud about because yeah. we could easily pull like 5 million views a video if that's all we cared about. Yeah. But it's like, it's just not worth it. Cause yeah. then what are yeah, you doing? You you're inspired just inspired about the project. Yeah. Then you're just, I don't know. It seems boring. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I agree. I think that's the biggest thing is not losing track of that. And like, exhausting. Just constantly chasing the trends and oh, what's yeah, popular yeah. instead of like what you actually want to do. Yeah. yeah. What, like TikTok sounds like, yeah, I don't know what's yeah. going on there. <laughs> I don't even understand TikTok, so. Uh, yeah. Talk I've tick. been having more fun with it recently because I just decided to not take it seriously at all. Do like whatever. that teeth yeah. pulling one I did with you the other day. Uh, yeah, yeah, the yeah, Tesla yeah, pulling yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like, it's like That's more of something you do on an Instagram story. I just... Filmed in a little more fast-paced way than I normally would have for TikTok specifically. But besides that, I was like, just throw stuff out there and yeah. see what sticks on TikTok. I mean, yeah. I think that it brings people over to your other stuff. and A tiny bit. Yeah. <laughs> Not yeah. very much, but... Yeah, but it's still worth it. It's there. Because cool. it's so easy. You know, maybe we put two weeks, three weeks into a YouTube video. Yeah. We put like three seconds into a TikTok. <laughs> yeah. If a hundred people find out about a YouTube channel that way, then it's probably worth it. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. And it's yeah. like a nice break. You like take we take the YouTube videos very seriously, so it's kind of fun just being like, eh. yeah, whatever, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> yeah, <it's a> <laughs> just point. see what goes on. Yeah. yeah, I think I've started a step away too from the like content creation in general, just because. I spend way too much time on my phone to begin with. I'm such right. a bad doom scroller. Yeah. Oh, so no. it's like, <laughs> I, I found when I was producing more content, you're trying to keep up the trends yep. and doing that and like trying to post. And it's like, I just need someone to do that for me if I'm going to do it because it's like, it's a habit for me that like definitely feels unhealthy. Yeah. yeah so it's same. like, I need to step away from it. But like that being said, there's some great inspiration on there. Like the van builds lately, like, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> there's and some really, have come to another level. really nice yeah. ones lately. Yeah. And I'm like, I got to. I'm not stealing any ideas. I just want to borrow some trends from it. Yeah, for so. sure. I mean, yeah, it's getting inspiration. Like, oh my not God, necessarily it's, stealing ideas. Yeah. Like, it's a great place to go. I mean, I think, I think, I don't remember who said it earlier, but like, you know, I think it maybe you, it's like less Google searching, more like TikToking or YouTubing or whatever. Like, yeah, you know, we're searching for content through social. Right. Like on how to do things or how to find things and inspiration. It's like I'm mm. not looking at magazines for inspiration now. I'm looking at creators and what they're doing and what right. other people are posting. Yeah. 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 It's, the world's changing fast as far as like that goes because Google's just been such a staple of yeah. information for such a long time. Like, Basically, since the internet was like cool enough, <laughs> it's been Google kind of dominated. You know, if you want to learn how to cook something, if you want to know what this code on your car means, you Google it. Yeah. But um, one of my friends has worked at Google for a long time, and he said the main thing they're worried about is TikTok. And I was like, but people don't Google. And I say Google. I don't even say they look search. up anymore. Yeah. I say people don't Google like how to make apple pie on TikTok. And he's like, yes, they do. And I was like, are you serious? And so I've I looked it up. I'm like, how to make apple pie? And there's like a few TikToks, but it's like, how is this anywhere near the quality of information you're getting on Google or YouTube right now? I think like, part of it is there's so much misinformation on the internet now you don't know what you're looking at. Right. Yeah, so it's right. like even how I mean, to maybe make not an apple, apple pie specifically. Oh, yeah. like, no, yeah. yeah. Apple pie and they're like actually using pears. And yeah. like, oh, yeah. oh no. no. But no, even <laughs> that is misinformation though because yeah. people do dumb stuff because it gets more views. It's like, this is how you True. make apple pie. Then they put in three cups of salt and then everyone goes in the comments and responds. That's not how you do it, but that's engagement. It brings more attention to the post and encourages more people to tell you how to make apple pie incorrectly. Yeah. Like I it's mean, like this weird. Yeah, but you also have the comments. You have the feedback system too. Yeah. to tell you like, is this a good idea? It's like, if, I'm, if you couldn't delete Amazon comments or like things like that, you probably get better <laughs> reviews that actually meant something, right? Yeah. You know, the whole review system is becoming more and more important. 
no matter who you are, contractor, worker, yeah. or like YouTuber, TikToker, or whatever, because like the comments themselves actually tell you what's going on in the content. Like, yes, there's a lot of everything, but like mm-hmm. someone's making it wrong. Someone's going to say everyone's making it wrong. You're going to look at those comments like, is this the right way? No. Right. Maybe. No, I mean, I do that not, on, yeah. on TikTok. If I see something really weird, I'll mm-hmm. be like, what the heck? And I'll just scroll through the comments to see like what people are saying about it. Yeah. If it's like true or not true or like if it's like a question that's unanswered, people in the comments will be like, yeah, it's this, you know, and it's that's kind of true. Yeah, but. yeah, and it seems like the the accurate comments do surface, even on all of our videos. Like, if there's something we obviously did wrong, yeah, like the top comment <laughs> is like very clear of what we did and that it's wrong, or what everybody <laughs> thinks is wrong yeah. based on their perspective. Yeah. The jet yeah. boat is the most recent one. Oh they, yeah, they built the That's... whole the whole front section of the hole into a gas tank. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. and unanimously the comments hated it and were like that's the worst way to build it and they're actually right if you're building a boat that's going to be like used in a normal boat sense of like going way out and going up especially jet boats are built for like going up crazy rivers ours is not that it's a one person little tiny toy that's a joke like it'll work really well (laughs) and be crazy but we're going to take it out for like 10 minutes at a time film some crazy videos with it and then bring it back like we're not going to be going bashing up giant rivers for hours on end so it's like the comments are right but they're also not they're not they don't have the context they don't have the context exactly yeah Yeah. (laughs) but it's something more like uh code 1977 on dodge means this yep then normally that's you know the first comment is like pretty accurate yep. or, oh yeah how to 100%. make apple pie it's like this pie is great or this pie is really bad you should watch this video instead <laughs> like those comments seem to yep. surface pretty well that's yeah. true was i think why reddit's one of the best social media platforms oh. Reddit is an amazing place. <laughs> I think it's like the only social media that's actually useful. Yeah, I think it's the only social media YouTube, that YouTube you can YouTube actually get like smarter by spending time on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean YouTube too. Just don't but go on Wall Street bets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, then you can be smarter and broke. Yes, <laughs> at the same time. I think it really depends on how you use it too, though. Like, I feel like I get, I, I learn a lot of interesting stuff on TikTok. Oh yeah, I mean, it's uh, like, for sure. There's a lot of dumb stuff, but if you yeah. pay attention to, if you watch the interesting stuff, like you. And learn, yeah. learn all sorts of interesting facts. You have to so. go there with intention, though. Like right. Reddit, Which, you can find some really interesting stuff that's going to lead you down a rabbit hole of researching more interesting stuff by accident. just from the generic front page. Uh, if true. you just go to the generic front page of TikTok, oh, yeah, no, it's yeah, 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 for hours. Yeah, 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 it's no, just absolute yeah. trash. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that's why I keep, I try and keep my doom scrolling to pooping only. So <laughs> I've, actually, I've actually tried to like implement that lately. Like, <laughs> I, ironically, I saw a TikTok that was on, yeah, well, I was on TikTok and I saw about this guy talking about, health. about, yeah, he was talking about like <laughs> scrolling and mental health and how like, it's just absolutely terrible for your brain to like scroll right before you go to bed and right when you wake up. And I was like, oh, I totally do that. I'm like, I go to bed and I'm like, ah, not, I'm like laying down. I'm not quite ready to sleep. I'll like scroll through TikTok or Instagram or whatever and yeah. just watch a few dumb things and then go to sleep. And then when I wake up, I pick up my phone to see what time it is. I like see all the texts or notifications that came in and I'm like not ready to get up yet and I scroll a bit and I was like oh I do that every day and it's probably not great because you're just like it's he was talking about it from a dopamine standpoint like you're just getting this like constant like hit constant over and over and over again just dopamine 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 like right before you go to bed right when you wake up and it's terrible Mm. so then yeah then I was like I was just like, oh yeah, I can just scroll when I poop and then not other times. <laughs> yeah, that's and it, right. like it's like that's your time to scroll. Like, there's no reason to not do it. Then you're just yeah. sitting there, you're yeah. not doing anything else. It's dual relief. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You get, you get, and then you just if you just like limit it to that time, it's like an easy way to like pick your time to get do your it. little fixing yeah. in there. Yeah, you know? that's so. when I post. If you guys. Following Grindhard, ever see posts that happen in the afternoon on Instagram or TikTok? Just know that that's Edwin relieving himself. <laughs> if it's in the morning, it's Steven posting at his like usual scheduled time to post our uh-huh. Instagram. So, and if it's a random yeah. post, it's Edwin pooping. But then if I get like a good video or something, I'll just throw it up there. You know, I'll yeah. be like, I'll be like, oh, it's night. The posted okay this morning. I'll just post another one. Nice. <laughs> that's kind of what I do because I'm I'm always like focused mainly on the YouTube videos, and Steven focuses on the other stuff, but. You know, if it's at night, got something good, you got to get it out there. <laughs> uh, so should we talk a little bit about what we did to the Tesla to get it fixed? Or do we want to save that for the video? I mean, um, some more in-depth stuff. Yeah, I feel like we could get more in-depth here than we could even in the video. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. 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 
Yeah, so I guess first maybe Ethan could describe how we got here yeah. in the first place, <laughs> yeah. and then we'll go to Ryan's part of the story. So uh, it, it all starts with King of the Hammers and a week straight of sleep deprivation and nonstop activity, basically. So um, we took our Tesla to King of the Hammers because it seemed like a good idea, um, and it, just the whole trip was chaos and lots of sleep deprivation. That's how we met Ryan in the first place. We had the Tesla there. He came up and was like, this thing's cool. I hear you have some problems with whatever. And so we started talking about it. We hung out and drove around in the Tesla at night and drove up to the top of, what is that? What is that? Chocolate, Chocolate Thunder, Thunder, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the names of the, re- the like, <laughs> trails. trails that came out are hilarious. Yeah, that sounds Backdoor, like... Chocolate Thunder. But yeah. all, it's all about poop, if you think about it. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Um, so, so what happens when men get together and only men? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a problem. <laughs> so part of our plan for that trip, we were working and hanging out with um, Go Fast Campers, and part of the plan was to do the Mojave Trail after KOH um, with our Tesla versus Graham, the owner, one of the owners of GFC, with his Jeep and do kind of like a, can we do this like iconic off-road overlanding trail in our Tesla? And, uh, you know, in retrospect, I should have asked you before we left of like, hey, how good is the Tesla going through water? Because I knew that was part of the trail. Graham was like, oh yeah, there's a really cool water crossing, it's like blah, blah, blah. You know? One of the worst water crossings. Of any, like, overland trail that I know of. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, you know, that's that's why I brought up the sleep deprivation thing. Because, like, I, you know, so we, we, we did King of the Hammers. And then we went to L.A. and did some stuff with Mike at Stance Works. And then right after that, we went to Hoonigan. And then, like, the same night we went to Hoonigan, we drove out to the start of the trail. And then started, like, got up super early so we could film at sunrise. And then, <laughs> and then started doing this trail. And, like, the first real obstacle we got to was a massive water crossing. And, like, I probably would have done it anyway. But I definitely wasn't in Maybe my not best twice. state of mind. <laughs> Maybe not twice. Yeah, right. I definitely wasn't in my most, uh, most clear thinking ever. But, yeah, so... Um, Graham drove through the water in his Jeep first, obviously to test it out. And it didn't, it wasn't that deep. Like it was like, okay, we're not going to get completely submerged and swamped. So, uh, we drove through it in the Tesla, um, made it to the other side. And like the water crossing was really kind of just there as like a really cool thing to do and film as like a test, uh, for our, for our video. We didn't actually need to go through it to get to what was on the other side. So Mm -hmm. I had to drive through it and then drive back through it. And I was like, Definitely concerned about it driving through the first time, but it went so well. I was like, oh, that oh yeah, was awesome. again, like, yeah. no problem. So I turned around, <laughs> came back through, and on the way back, like, of course, everybody's filming. We we're trying to get really cool shots, and I was like, oh, this is sweet. So I, like, I just went just a tiny bit faster and created a massive bow wave that just came all the way over the hood and halfway up the windshield. And I was like, this is cool. It did make a good shot. It was an excellent <laughs> shot. Uh, not worth it. In re- well, I guess worth it. I mean, it led to good things overall, but Mm -hmm. so massive bow wave and conveniently we did actually make it all the way out of the water and we get just, just out of the water, the whole, all four tires out car just shut off. Like the screen was still on, but all the moving, everything just shut off. We had a, a uh, photographer and journalist from, from car and driver with us filming or photographing and, and writing this whole story. So that was like another added level of like, you know, uh, motivation to do ridiculous stuff for that um here we go jason so, from car driver is awesome dude it was worth it that wasn't even the water oh, crossing wow. we killed it in but that was an excellent <laughs> shot That's definitely a good shot yeah <laughs> yeah so it was it's one of those things i mean you know it would have been better if it didn't destroy itself, but... Well, I mean, not really, because then Ryan wouldn't have had an excuse to come yeah. help us fix it. Mm-hmm. So, anyway, so we died, and we're sitting next to these train tracks in, like, 100-degree weather in the middle of the desert. It was, probably wasn't 100, but it was close. Very hot. Um, so, I just kind of messed around with it for a little bit to see if it was anything I could figure out, obviously. But, of course, there was nothing obvious wrong with it. So, I actually called Ryan... Um, and asked a bunch of questions and he had, he had some input and actually like one of your first suggestions was exactly what ended up being the problem, which is the VC front yeah. controller. Cause it's just fairly exposed and controls a lot of things. No. So we walked through some like basic, like looking at it steps and like testing things and jumping thing, jump starting or jump in case the high, the low voltage battery had gotten fried or shorted yeah. or something. Yeah. 
but um, she couldn't get it going. Nope. You had to tow it all the way home. Yep. And then it's just been sitting in the yard for months. Yes. And so you managed to come up here and figure it out for us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which is super cool. Yeah. It's been fun. Yeah. What was your initial thoughts and like processes on like figuring it out? Like, how did you do it? I mean, I think more or less like knowing what I know about the architecture of that vehicle and just past experience also going through too much water. Um, VC front is the weak point essentially in that car because it's a non conformally coded controller that sits like right in the front. The version that's on this car, I do know that there's a new version of it that they have on newer cars. I don't know how much better it is, but mm. um, I knew it wasn't conformally coded and it controls basically the left and right primary controllers on the vehicle. And if you're losing one entirely, it means it's not getting power. And the thing that controls power to that is VC front. And I should say that the Model 3 doesn't have fuses. So it's all called e-fused or whatever. It's all smart fusing. And all the primary e-fusing that drives the car from anything high power, including power from, you know, the battery, the big battery charging the low battery, all comes from VC front. All right. of the big stuff happens with VC front, like primary logic state machines, like vehicle states, all come from that controller. So, but it's also exposed, unfortunately. Right. Yeah. And it's like being exposed is fine if you know don't have a giant hole in your hood. Yeah, um, and don't drive through three feet of <laughs> you can drive through three really feet. muddy, like yeah. nasty yeah. water full of minerals and yeah, like, like three feet of water might have been okay if it was you like know pristine, if you had a bumper and other things so your bow wave is actually like, like the inside actually would be probably be yeah fairly dry right. yeah like mm. if it followed all of the normal leakage paths it's actually vc front's very unlikely to get affected unless it's a true flood like if you went through and pushed the bow wave likely hit is the water is only gonna be about half height based on just like the shape of the vehicle and the mm. speed you go through and the skid right. plates and all these other things like it wouldn't normally make it up that far but because the way it's the radiator the, is the, the yeah. hood is and everything else all that water is just smacking vc front and yes there's covers on it and everything else but one of the other things going back to kind of the original topic of like how to engineer things you know the engineer who's learned Traditional educationally is going to make sure water never makes it into the controller. Well, here's the thing. Water makes it into everything no matter what you do. <laughs> it's better to design it so it has a way out. And unfortunately, VC Front doesn't have a great way for it to go out. So the water just sits in there. Just yeah. goes in. And just goes in. at the bottom. Mm -hmm. like how our board yeah. Was. Actually, that reminds me. Maybe we should drill a hole in the bottom of the new one. But <laughs> oh, yeah. Make a drain hole. Yeah. yeah make a drain, drain hole. hole. Not a bad idea, right? It's like, yeah. So, um, <laughs> but because there's no drain hole or no way for the water to leave, any water that leaked in there sat in the bottom. And all of the controls for the right side, the, v, the right controller, are in the bottom of that controller. Sure enough, I think we lost the right controller mm -hmm. once you rebooted yep. it, right? The yeah, driver's it, side worked. Yeah, mm -hmm. the driver's side, windows and doors rolled up and down, or windows rolled up and down, doors open. Passenger side, nothing, or the occasional, mm. it actually had a bag duct, duct taped over the window for the last four months yeah. because the, right, the <laughs> yeah. right passenger, or the right rear window rolled itself down mm. and then wouldn't roll back mm. up. So it was just like a little, yeah, and that glitched itself down. Yeah, if it rolled itself down, that's probably some water in the right controller as well. That, that I had that problem when I went through. It was like torrential rain in the bay area one time it's right window kept rolling down and the seat was moving uncontrollably and the fan stopped <laughs> oh no <laughs> <laughs> sure enough there was a there was a leakage path there was no like a fender liner in that one car and all the water went up and like leaked into the back side of the controller and followed all the wires into the mm. controller no ah. fender liner mm. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah. we should grab the right the front controller we can point at things but like uh, the, uh, more or less, that was the thought. It was the VC front, right? It's yeah. just it's like the most likely thing considering the the conditions that we witness or water in the battery pack. But let's not assume worst case, right? And start no. there, right? So fix the easier stuff first. And fix what's if that potentially work, then easier. Go deeper. Exactly, mm -hmm. right? Like the battery pack, it's like you can open no. it, but you're not going to do much right off the bat. No. Drop it. You've got to do a bunch of work. Like VC front, not the easiest to get out, but not the worst. Easier. Yeah. And most likely. So you mentioned something I've never heard of before. The Model 3 is a fuseless car. Yeah. How does that work? So basically what they do is if you take like a certain component, like a resistor specifically, but like let's say it's very low resistance, so like 0 0.02 ohms, right? And you take that resistor and you put it in line with the circuit. On one side of the circuit, you can see the voltage on one side of the resistor, and then you measure it on the other side of that resistor. As current is flowing through it, so you can think of it as like water, like water flowing through it, you can measure the difference in pressure on each side of it because it's slightly restricted, right? So the flow is going to be slightly different on each side. If that 
pressure or that difference is too high on each side, that means the current is high. Mm-hmm. And if the current gets too high, it then will open up an electronic gate, which is like the MOSFET in this case or the switch. So they'll open that up and it'll shut down that source. And so what they do, you know, some of these more e-fuse stuff you can actually buy from like Switch Pros and some other stuff. There's some companies now that sell stuff. You put in the number you want for it and it does it. The VC front specifically is actually really nice because it's not fully digital. It's actually analog. So even if the chip dies on the board, it can, it will still reset. Hmm. It'll still reset that circuit. And once it sees the current's lower or it's cooled off or some other things, depending if it's a PTC fuse or some other things, like it'll come back or the controller can send a reset and it'll start measuring again. So it's much smarter and can do much more than a traditional fuse. Yeah, yeah, it's essentially a circuit breaker, but the problem is in this case, like a circuit breaker is nicer because you can like try again, take a look, and you're like, oh, what's going on? Hmm. VC front trips. There's no indicator to the driver, which right. I think is like to some extent a design flaw on Tesla's side. If I was designing it, I would have had all the circuits and there'd be like a service screen and be like, oh, this fuse blue and you can start diagnosing like, oh, look, like there's a giant water in my thing. <laughs> or like I went over like a branch and like ripped out a wire. So, you know, It'll something tell you to where help the you problem as a user, is. right? Yeah. Like mm. I think that one of the biggest issues with design, like a little deviation here, but like with automotive design these days is the assumption is a consum- consumer's an idiot. Right. And it's like, yes, they're an idiot because you don't give them the <laughs> there's opportunity. A, there's mm. a meme about this that I've seen a lot is that like 50 years ago, your owner's manual for your car would tell you how to adjust the valves. Yeah. And now it tells you not to drink the coolant. Yeah. <laughs> That's a really good example. It's, ex- <laughs> it's the most, it's the, it's the best example. Yeah. I've seen. And automakers like, are afraid of liability. You know, culture in the U.S. is just to sue everybody. You know? Right. It's, yeah. it's unfortunate. So uh, the consequences are higher and less frequent. So like, yeah. you feel really fine until it's really not fine. And it's not yeah. as obvious of a danger. It's like, you see a spinning fan, your brain's like, don't touch that. Exactly. That you thing see doesn't a heavy move. weight, your brain knows not to put it on top of you <laughs> in a way that it could fall. But you see two orange things. Yeah, it goes like, shiny. There's really yeah. nothing to tell you that going like this or going like this could end you. Yeah. No. Uh, I'll you be know. honest here and say that I have died already once from it. Yeah. So I mean, <laughs> like my heart has stopped as a consequence when I was doing plug and hybrid Prius is I've slipped on a rag and fell on a battery pack and my heart stopped. What? And like I just whacked myself in the chest and it started again. And I was like, well, that was unfortunate and got a hamburger. So, you did it yourself. You just- yeah. I just did that. I just like started to fall over. I'm like my chest hurts. I just started pounding on it. There's nothing around, no phone, no defibrillator, nothing, no people. Like it was like late at night wow. at the shop alone. It, it just like hit it really hard. as like fell on the ground and like, I don't know if I revived myself or I was just going to do it anyway. But like, I mean, right. something I've learned is like, some EMT guy told me, he's like, if you ever feel like it's not working, just start hitting it. <laughs> Who cares if it's bruising? <laughs> oh this my is gosh. kind of accurate to like cars. If it's not working, hit it with a hammer. It's yeah. Works. It kind of felt So you just way. like CPR yourself? Just like, ah, I, ah, I just ah, hit it like as ah. hard as I could. Yeah. I'm just like, <laughs> started again. So just so. one big one? I don't remember, to be honest. It was yeah, You were busy dying. Yeah, I was busy dying. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> one can <laughs> forgive uh, you for not. That not. being said, like, yeah, EVs are dangerous. I didn't scare me off at all no, anyway yeah. but like you know there's certain rules use one hand do other things and we're not really sure. educated on that yet exactly. like you said like it's not as obvious it's not as obvious and it's, there's not as much education yeah. and i think it doesn't mean it's more dangerous yeah. it's just a different danger it's, that people aren't it's that and then the second part of it is from the liability perspective is think about tesla and we talk about like the original fires yeah that like you kind of started hearing about that stock price was jumping all over the price place because of that so imagine there's all these people dying you're getting hurt or like something goes wrong with their car it's always tesla's fault yeah. Even if it's even, your fault. Even if it's not. It's because, you know, they're going to take anything they can to do that. So Tesla's been very careful and specifically doing it. I say Tesla because, like, yes, there's more electric cars out there. But they're the, but they are the primary looks focus. At. And that's what you sort of see. And, like, I think in recent weeks, even months, Tesla has opened up their service manuals and made their circuit diagrams available to anybody free of charge. And it's a huge step forward to right to repair. It's a huge step forward in so many ways that most traditional OEMs aren't even doing now. Before, right. they were the worst. Now, I'd say they're getting much better. That being said, That's I cool. can show you a bunch of this stuff, but in our case as well, you know, we found VC front had some damage. It looked like there was a short from ground to one of the primary, like, um, like circuits that was, like, checking things. And we could have potentially cleaned it with ultrasonic cleaner, some electronics cleaner. We kind of skipped that step. We, bought, actually, we bought a spare ahead of time. We bought a spare, so we thought we'd try it. And um, the spare, unfortunately, had a bunch of bent pins, and, you know, we replaced all those pins, soldered them in, and... Uh, we tried to get it going, and, you know, we had some help from a third party to help us out to do reflashing the controllers and other stuff like that because we don't have the tools right. to do that, unfortunately. And um, 
you know, with their help, we were able to try and flash that new controller, found that there was an additional issue with that controller, which was that it wasn't reading the 12-volt voltage, so it wouldn't update. And so then we, you know, couldn't go back to the old controller anymore. Because we'd pull, we'd we'd pull all the pins, pins out of it. from it, yeah. Which was kind of in the scheme of things, like, I probably would have done that different. I probably would have tried to clean the old one first. Right, and that's probably what we should have done. But tried we- that, and then, you know, done it, and then gone to the new controller and then realized that. Then we ended up buying a third one from a local junkyard. Um, went through the pro- sequence again. Found there was actually some wiring issues with the car that, that we, we just, just left on. We, we left undone. We just didn't see the wires. Fixed that. Got it going. And like, sure enough, it ran. It drove. And we're like, woohoo! This is great. And then we're like, all right. But the problem was with that new controller was that the enclosure was broken and knowing what we know about water. Yeah. <laughs> that, you know, <laughs> we also don't want it to get in from the top and there was a giant hole. So we wanted to swap it out. When we swapped the board out, we also conformally coated it to help with water resistance. Um, and something happened and we lost the front headlight and the wipers. So those both of those are on what's called a LIN bus, which is like a single wire communication bus, similar to K-Line for you GM folks. But um, <laughs> yeah, fun, fun. but the it basically all talks on like this little protocol, right? And there's no way around that protocol. And so we knew that it was down because the headlight was on. It was in a fail safe mode. And the wipers and the wipers were loose. loose. And so what happens is the wipers, as the integration engineer for the wipers, I know that there's a signal that's sent to the wipers to tell them to park consistently once it's powered up. Right. Mm. And because it wasn't parking and it was loose, we knew that there was no communication with it. So we kind of dug, we took the old controller, which, you know, um, the the first one that we pulled out of the car, and I started digging into the controller with the Dremel to try and figure out all the traces and paths that that LIN bus was taking inside the circuit board to determine where are our potential failure modes. Where the weak points are. And, like, I probably didn't need to do that completely. Um, we had three boards. We had three boards, thing, and so. I was kind of curious, and, like, I was like, maybe not, you know, it's hard to remember how to do these problem-solving steps sometimes, and knowing that at least that was the failure mode could have started with the transceiver but it's like you don't really know necessarily the default states i didn't know where the transceiver was on the board i didn't even know where the chip was at first and it took because there's like a hundred controllers on that board little chips and looking at all those part numbers takes time yeah um sure enough finally found you know dug into it found some traces found which you know, little controller it was. And then we compared it to another one and we put swapped them in and out of the car a few times and found that the actual bus itself was being pulled low. So that basically means that there's a potential short to ground and a partial a, short, partial short yeah. in our case. So we measured it originally and we didn't see anything unusual because it was like one kilo ohm. And the question is like, what is the nominal resistance? So we threw the other one in and it was like eight mega ohms. We're like, oh, big difference, big difference. So we knew there were at least, at least, something fishy there and so basically started removing components which i could have done a little bit more effectively but same thing like it's been a while (laughs) and uh, we pulled some of the components off basically all the parts around the lin transceiver we knew were still even with all them off it was still pulling to ground so it wasn't we through that we and by we i mean brian (laughs) figured out that Basically, none of the little chips on the board, none of those things were bad because you removed all of those and it was still pulling to ground. partially shorted to ground. Yeah, and we removed all the devices from the networks, so like nothing's plugged into the controller, yep. still pulling to ground. And so basically, it's somewhere between the transceiver and there's two pins. The way they laid it out, it's actually pretty clever. Normally, you'd have like a harness that does all the splicing, but the splice happens in the board. Inside the so board, basically, yeah. there's one pin that goes to the wipers and one pin that goes to the headlights. And then they're connected inside the board and they like go from like one side, goes to the headlights, and then from the headlights, it goes to the little transceiver. And then luckily, very luckily, like on next to the transceiver, there's a little dot, which is called a via. And that via allows it to go down, like tunnel through multiple layers of the board and attach to different layers for different... Different, you know, different reasons. Different, different basically you run different little channels and networks around it. Right. So you can move traces in different ways more effectively. So luckily there's a via with a small trace next to it and was able to cut. I realized that that via was directly connected to those two pins. That was the only thing left on the entire board that we could see. Right. You know, I didn't dremel out the entire board and see like what else is there. I mean, when we conformally coded, you know, we're doing it in a metal shop. We, there's some metal shavings around and we did find a little bit of metal debris on top of the conformal coating. Um, we, but we looked around, couldn't find anything obvious. Yeah. So nothing obvious for the short. So we did is we cut that trace. So it separates the transmitter from the rest of the board. 
and then basically ran, cut the two wires in the harness for the LIN, connected them together, and then basically ran a wire from the transceiver on the inside of the board to those wires. So we basically bypassed, you know, that, you know, little network. Just to some connect of the circuitry inside together. the board. We just bypass it with an actual piece of wire actually out of one of the headlights that we tore apart. Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> Took one of those pieces of headlight wires and soldered it onto the board and then epoxied it as well so that it wouldn't get Yeah, give it around. a nice strain relief so that yeah. way it would still work. I mean, it was not, it wasn't, I would have loved to have resoldered it to the pins, but because that connection between the pins happens in the middle of the board, I would have had to dremel out the board. Right. And so it's like, the risk with that is super high because you to, might cut yeah, another cut thing at the same time. Sure. So it was like <laughs> basically landed on that as the solution and it worked. Yeah. It was, well, I can't believe it worked. Yeah. Also, <laughs> the one part that I actually like physically helped with on this was we re-soldered some of the things on the board. And we're talking like, we're not talking things like this. They're like. Yeah, about like about a millimeter and a half they're millimeters. They're like a quarter of a grain of rice with solder on both ends. So we had both soldering irons going and. I held one soldering iron, Ryan held the other, and then he grabbed, with his other hand, he grabbed a pair of tweezers, itty bitty <laughs> tweezers, and pulled oh this, my like, gosh. grain of sand size thing off of one board, and then soldered it back onto the other one. We did Jeez. three of those, yeah. and then... <laughs> and, I, and I broke one of the traces desoldering the other, because I was doing it alone, we were doing it in the car, and I was just, like, using my soldering iron, just, just, like, prying these things off, and broke one of the traces when I did it, so we had to, like, do a little repair on that, too, yeah. but mm. it worked, so... It did, it works, now the headlights work, the wipers work. Yeah, so that was one of the cool upgrades we did, too, with this, is we ended up finding finding some broken headlights at the junkyard too yeah. and we're able to hook up all the original headlight functions to the led pods that we have mm. here so because before we just had switches janky wiring janky i mean not janky in the million. sense of like shorting out but just janky in the sense of looking terrible it just ran all over the place and then mm. inside the cabin there was just three rocker switches that we hadn't even gotten around to mounting just sitting inside the center console so if you're yeah. like driving down the highway and you have your high beams on you had to like oh which switch is it what <laughs> yeah. turn them off so now it all works with the integrated like Tesla system yeah. where the so auto, auto high beams auto works high beams. Yeah. like all of no, that works. and did, they con- did you hook those up to the control board of the original headlight like, yeah is that yeah. how you got it working that's how we did it so we basically had one broken headlight controller we siliconed like all the extra chunks of it off and then like uh, rewired it spent a bunch of time like learning how the original he- we had one headlight that worked because we had one that was broken but it still worked so we took that headlight and reverse engineered you know, what each pin did on the controller, roughly, like, it took a little bit of back and forth. Some things weren't what we thought, and kind of went back and forth, and then we were able to take those wires and then pick the behavior from those things and then map them to some map them to And then headlights. we chose which headlights we wanted for what, because we have, like, three different kinds of pods yeah. on there. I saw yeah. you guys playing around. I wasn't, like, directly with this project, but I saw you guys playing around with, like, voltages to the headlights and stuff, yeah. and it was changing how bright they were getting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, exactly. That's actually something we're going to change today. Ryan's going to add in the second. So, like, there's there was, if I remember right, there's three low-beam LED modules yeah. in the headlight, and you took one channel one channel of that for the LEDs. But that's uh, only, like, six volts. Yeah, so just as a quick, like, knowledge thing here. So the LEDs function on a constant current controller, meaning they deliver a specific amount of current. They don't care what the voltage is because an LED is brightness is dependent on the amount of current passing mm-hmm. through the element. Right. That's how it actually like functions. So in this case, if you look at like a 12 volt LED pod and you give it 12 volts, it has resistors in it that will make it always land at the current that it's supposed to be. The same amperage. The same amperage, right? But if you don't have those resistors in place, you actually decide what the current is and let the voltage be what it wants. So you can kind of run it two ways. Hmm. And because the LEDs in the headlamp are constant current controllers, they have voltage that fluctuates. But because we have 12 volt LED pods, we know that the nominal brightness for those is at 12 volts. Not right? at six. So not at six. Yeah. So when we put it on there, it was at six. We thought like maybe it's good enough because this is our low beam. We're not trying to blind people. These are, you know, you know, LED pods you can buy off the shelf. <clears throat> and so we're like, oh, we'll try that. We tried it last night and it was just a little too dim. It was. To do yeah, it. It was we thought actually, it was too bright. But actually driving it, it was very dim. Very dim. Oh, really? Yeah. Because we made, we actually also made them low beams. We like cut, we, you know, Ethan over here spray painted the inside of the 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 enclosures the housing, of, the, of yeah, the housing the yeah. lens basically the lens yeah and it's oh, like, it's like half of it yeah well <laughs> it's not even just strips yes yeah, two strips because each side yeah know, so two you elements. just eliminate those. yeah you're yeah. eliminating the upper half of the beam so we basically did that for like a cutoff beam and a projector basically exactly yeah mm. so basically nice. cut them both off and it actually works fairly well yeah. it's pretty cool um, but we're gonna have to add that other if we other add the other low beam channel in parallel we get twice the current and so we did that before and it got it up to about twelve volts nominal. 
which is awesome, but the LED <clears throat> gets pretty hot because it's probably also trying to maintain that current and it's pushing it through that resistor. So we'll see how long the LEDs last. If they don't, they're cheap. We can put new ones in. Yeah. No, and then for the sure. high beams, actually, to get them to work properly, <laughs> because we want to get that current, um, we actually put the lights in series instead of in parallel. So it kind of looks funny from it's, the wire. Yeah, the wiring is really weird. Mm. Yeah. It's so like, yeah. Well, something I didn't understand is like you guys were talking about having six volts and then all of a sudden you had like way higher voltage in that yeah, it was area. like 40 volts. You got to like 40 volts. How do you go from six volts to 40 volts? I like think it's, it's basically a matter of hitting that, that current limit. So it's basically when you're with the light there, once we added the second channel, uh, it, that channel apparently can provide more current overall. Oh, okay. And so when it provides that current, it hits it. And then the voltage is going to go higher to create a potential to try and pull the current with it, right? Oh, okay. So that's kind of what it does. Like if you voltage, as you increase it, you also potentially increase the amount of current that can flow because it's like the potential for flow to some extent. How do I think of it? It's like pressure. So if you increase the pressure, you can increase your flow if you have a big enough channel for it, right? Right. So it's basically in that case, like now you're increasing the pressure, like your flow could increase, but if you still have a small restrictor, you're going to max out your flow at a certain point. Yeah. Like so, a pressure washer, basically. Yeah. Like it, as, a, as an analogy, right? Like you're yeah. putting a ton of volume into a pressure washer and, you know, volume and thinking of like as amperage is current. Yeah. And then you're taking that and you're adding a massive amount of pressure to it. Yeah. So you're getting like the same flow, but at a way higher pressure, yeah. which would be like higher voltage. Yeah. Another way to think of it too is like think of like a barrel, right? Like if, if you think about the way gravity affects barrel, like if you have a one foot barrel and you have a small hole at the bottom, you're going to get so much flow. You're going to make, put it in two foot barrel, you're going to get more flow, three foot barrel, whatever. Right. And let's say your whole size doesn't change on the bottom. Eventually you're going to get to a point where no matter what you do... You don't get more flow. You don't really get more flow, right? Right. Like, if it, it technically changes, but it's so minuscule that right. you don't the, really it's notice, It's not right? a meaningful change. But, like, you keep going higher and higher and higher, the pressure around that sound rounding region gets higher. Eventually, the whole barrel is just going to just blow, blow out. out. Yeah. Because, like, it's not strong enough at the bottom to allow the flow to go through. So, if you look at it in the context of the headlight, that voltage is going up, but now it can't push more flow through it because there's a resistor in there that prevents it. And that resistor now is getting hot. Right. Because the only place it can dissipate it is in heat. Right. And so that's so the LEDs are getting hot as a consequence of it. So that's just something to take into account. Like, yes, it'll put wear and tear on it, but how much? I don't know. I mean, we'll find out. We'll find out. Worst case, like the LED goes out, we throw some new ones in there. Uh, We know also the number of elements in the original one, so we can actually match the performance um, if we wanted to do something custom. But hmm. and then I just I'm kind of curious because we didn't have a headlight before yeah so was that the main issue of not being able to update and yeah, all gonna, the problems we've had I was with mention there, there is a weird issue in like how tesla designed their software where they're like it looks for the headlight controller to be there to do the update and, and, a, not, and a bunch of other things a bunch too. of other things too but a bunch of other things can also not be there and it'll do it because right. it's like not important but the, but headlights, the headlights they have to be they on. have to be there yeah <laughs> and uh apparently it was fine one of them update the headlights was missing during the update and it still went through. That being said, we've had some weird behaviors, so might be related, but not exactly sure what's changed since I've worked there. But we just had one headlight while we were doing all this. When we, we had two controllers. We had two one control light. we had two controllers, but it started and it, the other one was just sitting on the table and I was like, Oh crap, one and of them I plugged it in. It, oh we just shoot. <laughs> so it it still worked fine in the scheme of things, but it's I'm curious. You know, I mean, I've worked there a long time. I don't know what's happening behind the scenes when we're doing these updates anymore. So it's like, who knows? Maybe you don't need the headlights anymore. We, we didn't really, we didn't try without the headlights once we had the mm. headlight controllers. Mm. I thought the yeah. original update we tried, but it no, didn't No, we did go that through. one night. We didn't have, before you went to the junkyard, we didn't have them. But Correct, but we didn't have the right front controller. It did, yeah, the front oh, controller. Oh, yeah, ours the front, was buggered yeah. up. The front yeah. controller was what was blocking the update that time. So yeah. we still don't know if... The well, also, the problem. what we found out later is that one of our wires that we had missed that was unplugged was also blocking the update. Yeah. So it's entirely possible that that controller could would have, would have, have, would have still updated. be yeah. updated. Yeah. We knows? don't know because... But you get, we just didn't have a plug. There was a wire um, that was hidden yeah. behind VC front yeah. that we didn't... A ground wire that we didn't yeah. see. Oh, go ahead. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm curious. I'd be so. curious to actually try and update the other spare controller just that we to have see. to see, yeah. see if it does it. But, like, right now, it's like, that was that was fun. Let's just not <laughs> fuck with yeah, it. Yeah, it works. <laughs> we've, we've taken VC front <laughs> yeah, out we can, 50 I, times. We've <laughs> taken out so many times. That controller is probably, like, really, I mean, it's already angry, clearly. Yeah. There's a wire solder to it in such right. a weird way. But it would be interesting to see if we could update it. Um, 
And then you'd have it as a spare in case you hit any more puddles. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna not drive through more. Yeah, well, it <laughs> still might be worth putting a hole in yeah. the bottom though, just so it has yes. water as a place yes. to escape instead. Yeah. Well, yeah, because and build, build it might be worth building a few <clears throat> other like splash shields yeah, and other things yeah. to just like. It's, but yeah, yeah we've, it'd be we've worth been, while. We've been working on it till like yeah. basically midnight for the last four nights. Yeah, I mean, we've <laughs> also been doing a lot of other things. A lot of other like, things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> take the dream camper out for a rip. We went camping. That was a lot of fun. What do you think of the dream camper? Oh, it was a wild ride. My leg. I'm pretty sure I've singed quite a few leg fairs off, but other than half, <laughs> that, like it needs some heat wrap on the exhaust. Yeah, pad. once I was in there and like I had a bandana on, <laughs> and it actually caught the it bandana had, on it, fire. It felt the bandana <laughs> fell off of his neck and fell onto the exhaust. That was oh, a no. terrifying experience. Like, oh no, I'm on fire! over there and I was like this is on fire and plug. <laughs> oh no my boy <laughs> oh no my boy <laughs> he's on fire <laughs> yeah, it's, it's hot camper, though. Oh, that was a wild ride I definitely it definitely needs a tiny camper for the top of it yes, so. yes. Mm-hmm. we were because it's called a dream camper I mean yeah, like, it, it, how are you going to do it without a camper <laughs> he was going to get a chance to drive uh, Colonel Sanders as well because I fixed the axle on it mm-hmm. but so I was driving Colonel Sanders to show him around the trails and by the time I like I did I showed him all the trails and then the other axle broke. No, no. <laughs> I know. I should have just put it in four wheel and Dude. then it would have taken the load off of them. But uh, I was. It's so much easier to drive in rear wheel drive. Yeah, I just it really is. I can imagine. Yeah, yeah. It, I think it's more fun to drive in four wheel drive though. You just feel the power just the torque steer power. is incredibly it's yeah, bad and it's, it's kind of fun i don't know i'd be, I'd be curious to take the dream camper out on two wheel for sure like because it's like it doesn't have that option right now yeah, yeah i know, I know. It's it's like, that's why i say it was like, or either yeah. i mean obviously sanders is down but like uh yeah what a wild ride for sure it's super fun i definitely yeah. would love to spend more time like really like trying to nail down the track and like clear yeah. that tabletop times yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. clearing the tabletop in the camper is tricky yeah, yeah. you need more power yeah well i mean you could do it at full power but then you're like at full throttle which jumping at full throttle is kind of weird you end up leaning back mm-hmm. too far yeah that's the like, thing the weight bias on it really makes it tricky because you like yep. full throttle kind of ease it off like mid through so it's like definitely getting mm-hmm. some weird hopscotch we don't need to be too sh- close to the yeah. end it's, it's like, such a short wheelbase too yeah, like, whoop, yeah. Whoop, does yeah. this all which is fun I, I it's definitely super ridiculous yeah, one definitely. of the top comments on the wheelie video was changing the uh, clutch and belt to get it to engage uh faster more yep more so, aggressively yeah that's still just probably like the original belt i've thought of that too yeah. we just get a brand new belt yeah that's like snowmobiles a lot. huge same system it's a cvt belt yeah, drive yeah, and like yeah. on a snowmobile you just put a new belt on it and it'll go from yeah. huh, to what yeah. like engagement it's just mm-hmm. it's a huge yeah thing. i bet so, that belt gets stretched out yeah. and we can put so. some um let's see what would we put in there and that quad uh, was crusty before we oh, started dude, oh, it's yeah. got so many miles yeah on, so much <laughs> abuse it's like, it was like a worker a on a farm for many years <laughs> yeah and then we had it and did not maintain it either we just yeah. like rode it and then left it in the woods because it wasn't important but no. <laughs> yeah i mean we could oh, let's no. see we could put a new belt on it and then we could uh put a slightly stiffer spring in it uh, in the primary clutch, and that would let it rev up a little higher before it engaged. So it would mm. go, wah, wah, and yeah. it would hit a lot harder. Oh, interesting. That could um, be good for getting speed for that jump. Yeah, you could also put lighter weights in the clutch, too, which would also do a similar thing. Mm. Um, but that changes it, like, throughout, whereas yeah. if you put a slightly stiffer spring, actually, it's not even a stiffer spring, put the same rate with higher preload. And the preload ah. on that spring just makes it so that it takes a little bit more RPM for the weights to engage the primary clutch that makes sense yeah ryan for people who are like they've been fiddling and making go-karts and just petrol go-karts and stuff like that what would you say is a good place to learn about electronics and electric motors and batteries is there people who want to build like an electric go-kart or electric dirt bike or something like that because the there is this kind start. of yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ryan's yeah. new channel yeah. uh, but there is this kind of like thing where when i got into electric dirt bikes it's really scary because it's like okay you can you know die. if your bike doesn't start it's like okay <laughs> you do you check spark you check compression you check like all these things like people know and it's been the same forever but it's kind of like, I know when I was getting into it, I'm like, if my bike stops working on top of a mountain, like, what do I even, you know, I it's scary. Yeah, I mean, so I, how, what would you say is a good way to get into it and start learning about it? It's a good question. Cause I think I haven't really looked for any, I, I these days I'd recommend normally a YouTube channel. It's educational on the content. And, mm. um, I haven't seen any particularly yet that really does a good job of breaking down electricity in a way that 
is meaningful to just the layman and the usefulness of it. Like, mm-hmm. there's plenty of people who break it down. Like, here's how to wire your house, and here, here's what you measure. Yeah, and here's there's this. all these very specific things. Like, where do you go to do just get general knowledge? Do you just buy something and start tearing it yeah, apart? I mean, or? honestly, there's a bunch of like, yeah, honestly, one of the best things to start with is just like an Arduino thing. Like, you can focus on like the big stuff, but like having a little bit of understanding about software and mm. a little bit of understanding of electronics like those basic kits are yeah. like play with all these sensors like you know put your hand over this light and then do this like yeah. you see so many artists building these amazing led things yeah, and with it's arduinos like, which with are arduinos. like 20 30 dollar computers Easy. that come with their own software it's yeah. linux right? and a lot of no not even linux it's no it's like it's, it's that's raspberry pi yeah oh okay yeah, i love right. the names of these things yeah. raspberry yeah. pi <laughs> the beagle bone yeah. Yeah. it's got capes it's yeah. like a little tiny computer you can program to do whatever you want. Yeah, yeah. It's They're basically cool. a little embedded chip, and it's it's super cool, really easy to use, and there's a bunch of really good how-to guides around that. There's a huge community behind it, which is mm-hmm. partially why I'd recommend that first. Is like, if you're having a problem, chances are someone else has had that problem with it, and there's a big community behind mm. that to help you. So you could start fiddling like that, say, I want to build my own garage door opener with that or exactly. something. Exactly, or make like my garage door opener where like I, you know, like put my hand over it or flash a light into a hole and then the garage door opens, right? Or something like yeah. that. Like, it's something some, different and funny. Or, yeah, like yeah. there's so many things like that. Like I remember, like, you know, you can, there's one of the kits you can get, it's like a hundred bucks or whatever. It comes with like a keypad and so you could make it like have a code to do something that. Like one of the first projects, um, not one of the first, one of my favorite ones I did was when I built my electric geometro. Um, I, Ryan has a deep love for Geometro. It's he's a deep. Been, it's, 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 he's been talking about it the whole time. It's <laughs> honestly, yeah. Geometros are honestly the best car ever built. Smiles per gallon is <laughs> very high. You can't beat it. You can't beat the smiles per gallon. Also, miles level. per gallon is very. It's, high. Just what I have to say. <laughs> it's, it's a combo: smiles and miles together. Most cars that have good smiles per gallon have extremely low miles per gallon. It's mm-hmm. a very inverse high inverse relationship. Yeah, there's usually. a very it's high a correlation. S- there. Very high correlation. You can't kill it. It's, it's a phenomenal car. That being said, <laughs> on that car, uh, someone broke into my other car and took all my keys. So I don't have the key to the car anymore. So I ripped. I just drilled out the ignition cylinder and was like, "Well, I need a new key," even though no one would ever steal that thing. It was a death trap. <laughs> but um, so I did is I took one of the RFID readers from one of those kits and like put it together with a relay and a timer. And so you'd flip the switch on to turn the car on. And then I had like a little RFID key in my wallet and just tap my wallet to the console in my Geo Metro and it would turn it on. That is sick. Yeah. You know, I was just like, Ding! and it would turn it on. And it was like really simple. And then I used it with my gas, like and put it on the original like ignition switch thing. I could plug it into a gas Geo Metro and you could do the same thing. Like, <laughs> and do the same um, thing. So one of my friends did that. He had a RFID chip inserted, inserted into his hand, oh, like right yeah, here. It's like the size of like a, a piece of rice. Yeah. And he set it up with his Harley, his house, his garage, his boat, all these things he just like when he gets on his Harley, he waves his hand over the gas tank, starts. Dude, yeah, that's <laughs> that is <laughs> yeah, that's I mean. pretty so sick. That sort of stuff is like the yeah. great place to start. Low mm-hmm. voltage electronics yeah. is the place to be. Once you get the high voltage and like electric vehicles, know mm. that it's all the same stuff applies. And it's yeah. really just a lot simpler. You've learned like how to use a multimeter in a way that's like, oh, here's the voltage here, here's the voltage here, there's that problem. And like maybe learning to use like a logic analyzer, like a Sali or an oscilloscope and learning how to interpret digital signals. Um, you know, it's kind of the way to go. So, like, learning how to use Serial and CAN and LIN and all that stuff. Mm. It's, like, not necessarily, but Serial, at a bare minimum, these days, CAN bus is, like, super popular. And it's, it's really quite easy to, once you get it. That being said, it took a while for me to get it, but now there's so many guides and tutorials out there. Mm. Um, I wish I could find this one book. There's this one how-to book on electronics I did. Um, I was a little bit older, but... The drawings in it were amazing. It was like all these little figurines, like moving around and like showing like how hmm. things work and stuff. And well, if you find it, we'll put it in the description. Oh, yeah, okay, if yeah. I find it, we'll put, put the description <laughs> below. <laughs> I don't know. I'm practicing here, so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. No, there's, there's. I don't know of anything specific, but I think Arduino is probably okay. always the easiest way, just because <clears throat> the community that comes with it. You know, yeah. that's a big part of that is having the support to figure those things out. Yeah. Another really cool thing you could do with that or with the chip in your hand, um, you can put your website and your personal like contact information in it. Ah. So he had it where if you had your Android phone unlocked, he could put his uh, hand over your phone and it would like give you the option to add his contact information into your phone. Oh, <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> yeah. I've seen those like on credit cards. So it's definitely possible. It's cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, uh, you know, it's like the ultimate business card. 
Yeah, because you are say, the business. As, as, long long as, great. Yeah. as long as they have an Android. Because he was just yeah. finishing wool and everyone <laughs> in that industry, a lot of people do. It's mm, so like yeah. he was just finishing up school and he was like, I'm going to get so many jobs. Like, I'm going to go to my interview and they're and I'm just going to like wave my hand over their phone and give them my contact information. Yeah. And they're going to be like, all right, this guy's serious. Well, a lot of stuff works yeah. on iPhone too now, just for context. Yeah, this uh, was, yeah, this was uh, before um, like Apple Pay was on I built into yeah, iPhones NFC, and all that. So, yeah. yeah, so now I'm sure that you can do the same thing. Thing with yeah, Apple same too, thing right? with the car. Um, Tesla uses NFC, and so you can actually buy rings and or those things online, and you can oh. start your Tesla with it. So it's the same exact technology that's in your little card that came yeah. with our Model 3, but then you could just put it in a ring or yeah, pretty much anything, right? They're it's so a little small. harder because they have a special application that lives in it, but yeah. Someone's okay. reverse engineered it and like, it <laughs> that's, well, that's awesome. awesome. The Tesla ring would be sick. Yeah, you just like touch it. You're just like, Dink, oh, I'm on my other road now. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's just like and a you can baller make your move. Too. Ring work on as many Teslas as you want. Like, yeah, I was gonna say I don't know if we want to talk about it on here necessarily, but Ryan has a card, a Tesla card like ours, just a standard Tesla card that has something like 80 Teslas yeah. on it. So you can this just like a really worn yeah. out key. It's got just the one half. of It's the ours e is on left. there now too. Yeah, so it's actually a good backup key. because if we ever lost our key now. Ryan has a backup. Yeah. And, and it's not like it's permanently there. Any like, you know, this is all friends, family. Oh, like obviously. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, it's like, you know, you drives after working there, you know, all of my friends are like, Yeah, you can borrow our Tesla. I'm like, okay, cool. Thanks, <laughs> guys. Yeah. That's nice. great. Right. So but it's like as a consequence, I'll be like, like, oh here's our key. I'm like, no, here, just touch it to the thing and then I'll I'll put my key on there when I'm done. You can delete it if you want, and no one's ended up really deleting it. So Right. Cool well, for me, I guess. Yeah. yeah. But, but they could just go in their app and then delete their key. Yeah, like it, it says if you go but once it's connected to Tesla. Um, it just says like RK key, right? It has my name on it. Even it's like once okay. it pairs, it even says it in your card. Doesn't because yep. yeah, it hasn't been on, on Wi Fi. It just says unknown key. But oh, when um, when you open it with your key, it says RK on the top. Oh, of it does screen. now? Okay, yeah. cool. But yeah. it'll even adjust the seats and stuff to where you last saved them, right? No, unfortunately, they that's don't different. Do cloud profiles yet in that context. Um, oh, I thought that. Seen, oh, that's interesting. I I've heard good. that it might be coming just from like from some people doing like you know. On the forums, you'll see people like reverse engineer the app and all kinds of stuff. And it yeah. okay. like it's possible. To Maybe that's like that. what I saw, not Tesla doing it themselves, but some random smart person it, figuring it out on their own. It's on the way for sure. And especially okay. cloud profiles in general amongst the automotive industry, we'll okay. see a lot more of that coming. Like, there's no reason why you couldn't. It's yeah, like, I was going to say. It's a matter of like handshaking with the servers, privacy, and a bunch of other stuff and how they want to manage that. Okay. Do you want to answer some questions that we pulled from our audience? Sure, yeah. Let's we'll see if we got some good stuff here. Um, <laughs> the top ones we pretty much just have to ask, even if they're dumb, right? Yeah. <laughs> How do you think the power grid will hold up with everyone switching to electric vehicles? I mean, that's a good question for sure. I mean, do you think it will affect the price of electricity? Kind of two questions. Mm, that's a good question. I think that the grid is ever expanding. I think. Um, Right now, there's still a lot of push on coal and like a different types of power plants. And around here specifically, there's a lot of hydro. So it's yeah. pretty mm -hmm. consistent power. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's going to be honestly that much stress. I think the stress comes from fast charging. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing a lot of, specifically Tesla is putting in a lot of power packs and basically energy offset devices like in place. So most grids right now function time of day they'll spin up power in the middle of the day and then at night they power down right if they could run at constant power all the time they would actually run a lot better in the scheme of things more efficiently, more efficiently yeah, yeah. Mm. so if they're running all the time at the same power and we have the ability to capture that power then reuse it during the peak power timeline you know it would probably be good so there's already a lot of work going into that and yes there is potentially stress going on to the grid. I'm actually more concerned about the charging infrastructure than I am the power grid. Really? But yeah. Most people who own an electric car are going to be charging it at home and overnight. I, yeah. Because there is ways of doing it. There's now chargers you can buy that tie into your power company and right. those will be cheaper. So they'll be like, hey, we're generating excess power right now. Please take our power. And then also mm. with vehicle to grid technology, which I think the F-150 is probably not the only one, but it's the, probably going to be the most prominent with the lightning. Yeah. And then the Kia is a Kia Ionic six, I think is something like that. That also has it. We could basically use your car as a backup generator for a your backup house. battery. And I think it's, it's not just that, but it's also to offset the grid peaks. Right. So it's like, it's, it's a hot day and your car's plugged in the grid's like, eh, it's just like, it'll, you know, pull some power from your car during that timeline. Mm -hmm. It's fine. You know, you get 300 miles range and I get 250. It's like, you'll be fine. You could probably, you'll probably be a lot more 
interactions and functions and how we interact with our car in that way. Like, oh, I need at least 200 miles. And then it uses that like 100 miles of buffer to like go back and forth between. Them. Is that something that's realistically going to happen? What, I, car charging like, the grid? Yeah, because, well, for a while, Tesla was talking about, like, when they were selling the their cars, they were saying that you'll be able to, I forget the word they had for it, but basically leave it plugged in where they would pay you to use power from your car when they needed mm, peak demand. Yeah. And then you could actually, like, have some sort of passive income just by your car sitting in the garage. Potentially, yeah. I mean, so, it's called micro, basically it's the idea of microgrid technology, which is instead of having one big power plant, you have tons of small ones. So mm -hmm. people with solar power packs, et cetera, yeah. and like creating like more of a community grid that's local to like your specific zone mm -hmm. that I see being a lot more popular. And I think it's in Australia that Tesla has that where yep. they're actually, so. you can register your power pack, not your car, but your power pack to be a micro oh. power plant and you can actually make some money from it already. I think it just happened in the last month or so. I don't that's know if you cool. actually make money from it or not. It might just offset your power bill still, but right. um, still, there's that's something, money. there is some financial association uh, with that and like how you can register that. The reason it doesn't happen on the car side right now is because the way the invert, the basically the charging equipment's designed only one way. Mm -hmm. They could have designed it bi-directionally and cost but more money. Not, yeah. Yeah. Um, Which is why you mentioned the Ford is it is both ways. Actually, it's not either. Ironically oh. enough, the charger <laughs> they sell you allows that to work. So basically, there's a protocol called CCS, which is a DC fast charging. So essentially, if you think about it, right now, if you're looking at your car outside, I plug in the cord to the wall into the Tesla. AC power from your wall outlet's going into the car. It's converting that into DC energy. Right. If you were to plug in a fast charger, like go to a supercharger, straight DC power right. is going in. The chargers are off board because mm. they're so big, it doesn't make sense to build it into the car. Yeah. Now, if you were to take them, put it in reverse... You can close it and put DC to the plug. That's fine. But you can't generate AC. There's not equipment in there to in generate, the car AC to generate AC. Oh, yeah, so yeah. you can't put it back. Into yeah, but you can put DC power back. So then if you have the other piece of equipment on, on the, the other side, yeah. on the wall, to take that energy and put it back in, you can then do you it can do with that. like that car or any car with CCS, etc. as long as the car supports the software. So the F-150 software side supports power leaving the outlet via DC, so CCS in the case of the F-150. And they've partnered up with a charging company to provide a wall unit that does that. Oh, okay. And does Tesla have the software or not for, for sending DC power back out? I honestly don't know. I haven't seen anyone play with it. It does support CCS now in the U.S. as of recently. What does CCS stand for? Uh, I have no idea. Oh. <laughs> Ryan something has all something charging standard. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Probably. It's honestly, it's made by a committee, so I'm indifferent to what their decisions are. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, there's a lot of things about CCS I don't find very particularly great, but that's fine. It doesn't make a difference. It's just very expensive for what it is, and they overcomplicated something in an automotive application. But it actually has a really lot of cool future functions. Like your car can talk via the charger over the internet to the power plant, technically mm. speaking, via the protocol. That's cool. But it doesn't hmm. do it currently. <laughs> Okay. Well, well, technically, it's still a step somewhere. Somewhere, yeah. Exactly. It's a step. <laughs> yeah. Power prices might go up is also the answer to that question. Oh, I right. I, yeah. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> to be honest, I don't have enough. I mean, the price of everything goes up, is going up, so, you know. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But I think, I mean, it's relatively, hopefully, it stays low. I mean, and I mean, you know, the, the price of electricity is already insanely low compared to the price of here. pretty much everything else. You'd be surprised. I have a friend who lives in the mountains in California, and he's paying... 25 30 cents a kilowatt hour oh so, i mean that's he only has to have a car that gets 30 miles per gallon to be more to efficient be than an electric car cost to be more yeah, cost effective that makes yeah. sense yeah. not right now but yeah back when i looked in 2012 yeah. yeah i think the average for idaho is nine for the entire state yeah. even eight, like eight your big nine, cities yeah, and stuff that's like yeah, that's yeah that's pacific right. northwest is pretty cheap which like you could charge an entire model x for like five bucks yeah, yeah. that's great <laughs> that being said fast charging rates screw you all you charging companies and overcharging people like wow if you think about it, if you're ever in the lobbying or work in politics, like, <laughs> I don't know why you would, but, uh, you know, you should definitely be lobbying for price per kilowatt hour, not price per hour. And a lot of charging companies are trying to get or, or basically around that because they make more money, obviously, because like their equipment can be broken and only be delivering one tenth the power, but they're still but charging, you're still charging per hour. Uh, so yeah. they're still you need to be charging per your deliverable cost. Like if you were going to buy fuel, you buy fuel by the gallon, you'll pay more than that. Yeah. So you should be buying fuel by the kilowatt hour because that's basically the same. It's, as it's the equivalent. The I mean, yeah, it's the equivalency. It's so measurement. Yeah. So you're measuring yeah. the quantity, not the time. Yeah. So you should be measuring quantity, and so it's some places it's actually cheaper with time. Texas is one of those places where their time charges are actually less because it charges so fast. 
Huh. But it hmm. can be more. Right. So. Uh, an overwhelming question is, is battery tech going to change in the near future? This has, like, come up, like, 20 times. So yeah. I'm scrolling down. Like, are we staying with lithium? Are we going to... Do you think we're going to go to something else? Or... I think there's, I mean, there's tons of changes coming and it all comes down to manufacturing. The 4860 cell from Tesla is really awesome cell. Graphene batteries are very close. I know some companies oh, are hearing about, about, about graphene yeah. batteries. That being said, I actually don't recall the advantages of graphene batteries. So I'm just saying that. I like thought a it was supposedly like way faster charging. <laughs> well, way yeah, faster like, charging, but you can fit more energy in a smaller more energy space. Energy dense. Yeah. The question is by how much and is it, is it energy dense or is it power dense? So it's two different types of cells. So like something that can hold more capacity or can it deliver more power quickly? Right. Power density is able to discharge it incredibly quickly. Or charge, yeah. Or exactly. charge. Yeah. Or cycle life is better. I'm not sure with graphene. I forget the principles behind it that dictate that. I know solid state batteries, QuantumScape is working on that. And that's really cool because that's basically a battery that just doesn't really wear out and charge super fast as well. And it's built more with silica. It's a more sand Sand. Yeah, Sand. Very cheap. Yeah, very cheap. You know, lithium mining and all that is very controversial in some ways, but you'll get a lot of other types of mining to build your other stuff, and that's all yeah, right. terrible too. It's, so it's like, yeah. you know, yes, we're more involved with third world countries in that interaction, but it's like ultimately the one thing is now with uh, Redwood Materials and some other recycling companies, we're starting to see, you know, 90 plus percent of the materials going back into new cars. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's and the other really thing cool. too, second life, like your gas engine dies. How often does your gas engine end up somewhere else? Very rarely. Yeah. Well, if the engine is what dies, oh, never. Yeah. But like, Unless it's a rare engine. That's yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> so like a majority of the time, it's like, you know, your electric car yeah. dies. Like, cool, I can take those batteries and make that stationary storage for my house. I can take the motor and go put it in the creek and like, you yeah. know. You can rip all the, the Tesla stuff off of it, and it's still just a battery at the end of the day, and it's just a motor at the end of the day. And people yeah. have reverse engineered it and, like, just got rid of all the Tesla part of it, except for, like, the core material that's there and allow other people to use it, which is awesome, you know. Right. Yeah, that's awesome. You know, it's like, you know, you want to buy, like, a new Corvette motor. It's, like, the level of integration necessary of that. It's a pain in the ass. You have to do standalone. You're not going to get the same tuning and all those other things. Same thing with the motor, but the motor's a lot easier. It's just, yeah, it's way simpler to tune than a... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> then an internal combustion engine with variable valve timing, variable <laughs> like all the insane stuff that goes along with a modern engine exactly. to like yeah. not keep up with an electric yeah. motor. <laughs> I think even the computer part of the complexity of an engine like that is crazier than a Tesla. Yeah, I mean the Tesla is just one spinning part. It's like, yeah, you know, plug in the thing, you tell I want this much torque, and it's like okay. Yeah. You go. You're the torque, sir. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty simple. Yeah, that's easier in a lot of ways. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, I think people don't understand how easy it is to do an EV swap. I being sad, doing it safely and thinking through a lot and, of those yeah, problems takes some time. And, mm -hmm. Um, you know, people are probably gonna get hurt and die and screw up and i'm pretty sure the first people who put gas engines and things also probably lit on fire and i mean yeah. people, fuel, people so. still build terrible go-karts in their backyard and die like yeah it's, it's like it's, it's no different not only is that different the different like we were talking about, like you can whether or not you see it coming essentially yeah. to some different extent. reasons maybe but. yeah mm -hmm. a lot of people are asking if you could just put a solar panel on the top oh. of your oh no. and get infinite energy and this has been one that's come up like Ugh. A good amount of time. I really hope people uploaded. are joking. Yeah. They are not joking. I know they're not joking. So, <laughs> they're, I, well, they're mainly asking if you can generate power through a solar panel while you're parked. Or yes. Like, Answer to that is yes. So they're wondering kind of why Tesla isn't doing that. Which it's I not efficient and it's not cost effective. No. Yeah. And there's a big reason. It's like the additional cost of building that solar panel custom is going to cost. You know, hundreds at, le at least dollars, right? And yeah. then production and volume, it's a lot. More like it might offset your air conditioning to keep the cabin cool or things like that. And don't get me wrong, that's definitely coming. Yeah, for sure. It, it's like it's inevitable. definitely coming. It's inevitable that it's coming. But that thing will, you know, on a roof like that big, you're probably looking at, I mean, like model three roof, five hundred, six hundred watts, watts yeah. may, maybe. And just an example, like your standard wall outlet can charge at one point. Five kilowatts ish. Yeah. Three times in general, it's one point two kilowatts. Yeah. So you know it's twice the amount, and that's a standard wall outlet. And the standard wall outlet will charge a Model Three, standard Model Three, not standard range, but just like most common, like yeah. large battery Model Three. That takes over twenty four hours. Yeah, like it'll just say, and that's perfect power. It just says twenty four hours plus. That's a hundred percent constant for over an entire day from your wall outlet. Now try doing that with a solar panel that's producing half to a third as much and only when the sun is shining perfectly on it is it producing that. Another exactly. thing too that I think that 
conceptually people don't think about when they think about these things is when you're in a Tesla, the glass just goes all the way up over the entire thing. And it's such a nice view. And it's just very like luxurious feeling, very yeah. high end. And if you put just to sacrifice, it costs more money and you wouldn't be able to see out your You roof. could see maybe the panels. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> The thing that where I see it being more used is like, let's say you own a Rivian, for instance, and you get the camp kitchen option. What it might do is prevent you from losing any of your range while camping well, yeah. and using mm. your kitchen. Isn't yeah. the, um, they were talking about the Cybertruck having a bed cover that's solar panels. Maybe, yeah. I uh, mean, I don't know. I mean, that same yeah. sort of offset. Like, it's yeah. not that big, but it's like, you know, if you have a camper or like some other things, like, it's still going to do something. Yeah. Is it worth the cost? Mm -hmm. Maybe not yet. Solar tech is also improving a lot. Right. Yeah, it's already so improved a lot from what it it's was. It's already improved a lot, and there's a lot of stuff potentially coming and down the road. So right. I think that that's one of those areas mm -hmm. where we'll see a lot of improvement and a lot of stuff, too, with, like, okay, if you're in a parking lot, maybe we'll see some weird cars with, like, pop-up wind turbines or something yeah. like that. Oh, like, pop-up mm -hmm. and down headlights, but wind turbines. <laughs> but as long as they're not out when you're driving, that doesn't work either. Though. Oh, yeah. That's <laughs> as far as, like, new laws. <laughs> you can never get a lot of people ask me that. <laughs> no. 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 There's another... Never, no, if, it, if it came up though, like if you have like a standard gas car and you want to generate energy, if that popped up when you're coasting downhill, go for it. Like you know, that's yeah. free energy. You know, potential energy on the uh, grade. But also, like, if you're spinning down. a wind turbine, you're also losing. Like you're slowing Unless yourself. You're, slow, you're down, using it to slow. So you're yourself. not. Yeah, yeah to generate not, energy because you know it's. It's lost. just another form of regen braking is the yeah. only way it works. Yeah, so exactly. You're not. Something that um, some company started doing it is regenerative suspension. Yeah. Because that's a point where you're actually just wasting energy all day to make your ride smooth. Yeah. I've been thinking about that too, actually. It's it's one of those areas where like specifically in bumpy areas and other stuff where that could be possible. Same thing, cost doesn't make sense yeah. there. But we're seeing more and more intelligent suspension. Look at the Rivian yeah, hydrodynamic active yeah. suspension that, you know, they're doing crazy damping with. Um I think it's like the maglev suspension that's now, I think the McLaren, I forget. But there's like yeah. certain cars that actually have electromagnetic suspension. And like, I think that's an area where we could see some really cool energy gains and losses yeah. too, for that fact. Right. But like we could do some really interesting stuff in terms of ride comfort and development and potential, you know, more energy gathering. Like out here yeah. where you live, it's you know, bumpy roads, you got other things going on and mm -hmm. it's probably not that much energy. But, but it's something. It's something. Yeah. And otherwise, it's just heat. And it makes the most sense on an electric car. Yep. And you could probably even, like, get rid of your sway bar like that, like the hydraulic oh, pressure sure. yep. on the other side. Yep. Like, yeah, the Rivian doesn't even have a sway bar. It doesn't. Car. Really? No, yeah. yeah. It has a hydraulic cross-link suspension, and basically they close the valve, and the fluid won't flow and from it, one side to the other. That, is, that is super cool. Yeah, is that can, changeable in a mode? Like, can you, like, stiffen it yeah, or loosen it? So That's basically, sick. you have the system there already. Throw a little... A uh, hydraulic motor, basically a hydraulic motor yeah. that is spun by the fluid. Yeah, that's one way to do it. I personally hate anything with hydraulic fluid after my own experiences with it. It's not necessarily the desert. desert. <laughs> it's not even that. It's like, when well, it fails, you ain't fixing it. Yeah, you right. Know. It's just not out there. Gone. Yeah, no. you need like that a pump and a bleeder and like all this stuff. So. Like, I remember being out in Texas with a prototype, you know, a fitting fell off and we had no roll control, no damping, nothing for 400 miles getting back into town. And back to the question, to the point that yeah. you made of solar technology getting better and better progressively. Yeah. So maybe in the future there's something. I was researching a lot of this last month, and it seems like semi-transparent solar panels are becoming more and more of a thing. Yeah. So you can make it into a window or something. Well, so you could have the same perfect glass roof of a Tesla, have this really luxurious feeling, look up, see the bridge, drive through Yosemite, look up, see the cliffs. But it would be still solar. be generating power. It's yeah. not as efficient, but they already have the technology. Yeah. Because I was looking at it. Oh, it'd be sick to make solar gazebos. Oh, that would be but sick. But that are semi-transparent, though. Well, because you want, because like, like the Tesla, the wind, the roof is roof glass is tinted very dark because you don't want it to be full blast of sun. Yeah, exactly. I do so. wish it, you know, transition lenses, like, for, like, yes. Yeah. Why is it not why solar? Is it's that, not a transition yes. lens. Yeah. Isn't it at night? You can see the stars. This I know. is something that I've been feeling, and I'm like, why aren't they doing it? Yeah, it would be so that would be cool. Cool. Oh, There's so many instances where, like, once solar gets transparent, that's insane. The technology might not be moving in a way that's more efficient necessarily, but the use of that it, technology more is becoming more Yeah, because yeah. if because if I built a gazebo at my place and put solar panels up there, it would block a lot of my view and it'd be cool, but not cool enough to make it worth it. Yeah. But if it was semi-transparent, then it would just be worth totally. it all the way around. And even if it was more expensive and less efficient, 
I think people would still jump for it just because it's cool. Oh, totally. Yeah. Actually, to jump back real quick to that power plant statement, one of the things I'm hoping we move back to is nuclear. It's one of still the oh, best I ways completely agree. for clean power. I, yeah. And I hope the general public realizes that nuclear yeah. is actually very safe. And, and it's very clean. It's, it's very, very... I was no waste. To, I tried to explain this to my mom all the time, but she grew up in, like, the <laughs> era where nuclear, like, happened. And Weapons. Then, and Weapons. then people... Well, yeah, <laughs> and then, like, Chernobyl and all of that. Yeah. And, like, then everyone was like, no, we cannot have this. It'll never be safe, yeah. which isn't true. Like... Chernobyl mm-hmm. happened for a lot of reasons, yeah. but like yeah. it's not. Yeah, yeah. they yeah. already have self cooling plants that what well, happened at Chernobyl could never happen. Again. Well, I think exactly. no. so. A friend of mine's mom works for Berkeley with their nuclear program, and they were working on micro reactors. So basically, the yeah. idea is you have a reactor; it's completely embedded in concrete, self sustaining. You don't touch it, and it just sits like you bury it in the ground, and it powers a hundred houses. Yeah. Right, not that many, but it's just like it will work for a hundred years, and then you just pull it out of the ground and shred the, the material goes to waste. You shred it, and then you put in a new one. Like imagine that hundred houses for a hundred years for that's thing the size of half of a dumpster. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, like, that's awesome. And it makes way more sense. It's microized, so then even its failure mode isn't bad. Right, like that's the problem. We're building everything in such a centralized fashion that distributed power, no matter what way. Is probably going to be more of the way of the future, where the failure modes are less impactful. Yeah. Also, like you have way less losses if it's more localized. Like exactly. the amount of loss in a huge transmission line across, yeah. you know, hundreds or thousands of miles. Like, totally, and I think it's a lot of energy. Yeah, there's definitely a lot to be said about like the future in that context yeah. and how that interacts with electric cars and I don't know, maybe even nuclear cars. I don't know. I've never tried that concept, but like yeah. Yeah. nuclear submarines. But right, like, yeah. or even if we use nuclear power to charge, you know, yeah. electric cars, we're something. It's going to be a the, lot better for our environment. One of the dumbest arguments that I hear all the time about electric cars is people are like, well, you're just fueling that electric car with a coal power plant. Not well, true. hopefully not. Yeah. Also, that's not the problem. The yeah. problem is the coal power plant, not the f- electric yeah. car. Yeah. You know, people use it as an argument against electric cars when it's really an argument against coal power plants. Yeah. And there's really good heat maps you can look online. There's only like two or three cities in the entire country where it's less efficient to charge a Tesla than it is to yeah. Oh, yeah. Just put very, gas in a car, few. and it's yeah. places where it's 100 percent coal. Yeah. And yeah. actually, like when people bring up the fact that like you're charging at events, you're using like diesel generators to charge your electric car. You're using a lot more, a lot less energy from that diesel generator than driving a gas. It's still car. more efficient. Yeah. It's yeah. way more efficient than and, yeah, and driving. In some ways. For- it can be. There's still a lot of wastes. In oh, that. yeah. It, it moving from AC to yeah. DC and, like, all that transition. Back and forth. State, like, back and forth there is definitely not the most yeah. efficient thing. I don't remember the number, and so obviously, like, don't take me granted <laughs> here, but, like, it takes, I think, like, what? Is it, like, one gallon of gasoline is, like... It, it's 33 seven. kilowatt hours of energy events or electricity like I, think I don't remember but there's like a number and long story short like you look at it and it's like to refine the oil to gasoline versus using the oil straight into power is oh, more efficient yeah then like converting it the other way so i don't remember the numbers i wish i did but um it's also changed a bunch too or the last oh, year. so which way is more efficient so is it it's more, more efficient to make electricity directly than it is to refine the fuel no. Right, just, just it bring it out of the it. ground and turn it into electricity rather than turn it into gasoline and burn it. No. Yes, okay. yeah, exactly. Cool. Sorry, that's what I'm trying yeah. to say. Yeah. And another factor, too, is even if you're charging your Tesla on a diesel generator, that pollution when you drive through the city isn't in the city. Yeah. It's it off be where the moves. power was generated. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you're not when you have all in one place. big problems like in Los Angeles oh. um, is a really good example <laughs> because the Angel Mountains are here, the city is here. So it's just you make home. all these this pollution and it just stays there. Yeah. Whereas even if you just had a diesel generator on the other side of the mountain, <laughs> and yeah. if, even if it was a one to one, it would still be a net benefit for Humanity, local health, yeah. Yeah, yeah, local health, and, and that's a huge factor. Yeah, and look at Salt Lake City too; it's trapped between those ranges. Yeah. There, it's one of the it's worst air quality. There. It's it's really weird. You wouldn't expect that such a beautiful area, but yeah. it's like it just traps it all right in that area. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And I mean, one of my, I mean, just because we're like on this topic of charging and that right now, it's like one of my favorite parts of electric cars is think about this: like, imagine you go on your commute every day and you never have to stop. I agree. Yeah. So that's mm-hmm. what people don't realize. You're like, where do you charge? What do you do? It's like you charge at home. Your car, your house is your power plant and your gas station. It's you know, you, daily. You're not going to be starting at a tra- stopping at a charger at the store and all those things. And mm-hmm. It's like that is what makes it convenient. That being said, I know the argument about apartment buildings and a lot of other things and city living. And I live in New York City majority of the time right now. 
And yes, an electric car is not convenient. I will a admit car to is that. Not convenient. Yeah, it does. A car, car is, car is not convenient. New York. <laughs> I prefer a bicycle and I prefer the subway. Yeah, and like you know, and one I, wheels. Yeah, and one wheels. wheels. Yeah. 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 Actually, no, probably not there. You'll get hit. I've been oh. hit already a few times. Oh, but, yeah. oh shit. Um, but in that context, like yeah, <laughs> otherwise I'd probably agree with that. Um, but yeah. City living and that stuff gets technical, and that's where, like, Europe has it nailed. You know, Europe has basically put charging terminals into every post, and you bring your own cord. So, mm. because here, the standard is the cord comes on the station. Right. There, you bring your own cord. It makes way more sense, because, like, a lot of charging stations here are broken because the cords are worn out. Right. It's like you as the user should be liable for that. And so the U.S. standard kind of screwed up, and Europe actually has significantly more electric cars as a consequence. Right. The infrastructure yeah. is a lot yeah. better. Like, you go in, the, you're in the city... You know, half the charging spots are reversed for reserved for electric cars. And all of those have like posts or things coming out of the ground you just plug into. And the socket's not gonna fail. It's the cord that's gonna fail. Right. Mm. Yeah, because then they don't have any yank it too hard or like yeah, break it off, all these things. So. Step on it yeah, or right. cut it. Seal itself for copper. I mean, people do all kinds of terrible yeah. things. Right. I was wondering if theft was an issue bringing your own cord. Uh bring your own cord, no. Public cords, yes. Because the public mm. cords are just sitting there unattended all the time. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Like if someone's car is attached to it, they'll know instantly. Yeah, and it's theft is less. Also, if you try to cut a cord locks. that's like full power, power, you might just die. Might yeah, just exactly. Yeah, it's the thing. So, like when you got once plugged in on both sides, two things: a, you'll get shocked; two, when you plug it in, it locks on the car and on the station side. Oh, yeah. okay, yeah. that makes. So you have to cut okay. both ends separately. Yeah, you have to cut and the ends, yeah. and the connector would still be stuck. And so yeah. you just want, yeah, 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 exactly. Okay. Uh, what happens to lithium batteries after they die? And also, what impact does mining lithium have? Versus like coal. Now, that's a question that's kind of come up a lot, so that's why. That's an interesting one. Um, yeah. And we sort of covered that a little bit. Yeah, already. we did. Yeah. And um, I guess more specifically, like on the what was the first question again? There. What happens to lithium batteries after when yeah. they die? Yeah, when they die. I mean, now there's recycling. That's a big part of it. That's yeah. only the recent years. And recycling of lithium was terrible. For a bit. Maybe now, a better like way to recover majority of materials and they mm. go into vehicles now. Well, that's a big part of that too is. They live a very long time, and we can use them for a very long time. Yeah, yeah. Just don't throw, don't throw in the trash. Right. But maybe a better way to rephrase that question is: What is physically breaking down to why that battery isn't working? And does lithium wear out? Like, yeah, what, I mean, of course. It, you know, like, what what happens? happens? Cycles. How do I? Ex- basically, there's like an anode and a cathode. So you have like two plates, right? And those plates have an electric potential between the two. And every time you charge and discharge material builds up on one of the plates and when that material builds up its capacity does have has less ability to move electrons um back and forth between the two plates it has less of an ability to have capacity between those two plates okay and so as you cycle each charge that material will break down and its ability to stick electrons and have them pass through the two starts to fail essentially and then you can recycle it and use it again yeah so basically they'll stick it in different baths and they'll strip the materials off each and then they go through processing but the lithium itself doesn't wear out the lithium lithium itself won't wear out yeah the battery wears out but the lithium is all still there it doesn't go so that part once you separate it you can just recycle the lithium it goes back in yeah the lithium is pretty easy to recycle it's all the other stuff in it Mm. so a lot of nickel and cobalt and stuff like that so you got to get all the metals out of it before you can put it in the new battery basically exactly yeah okay separate it all out so you can re just like any other recycling really you have to like separate all the different components like that's why a lot of things don't get recycled is because they're like like, there's no profit in it lithium recycling is now super profitable yeah right which in its own inherently will just get more and more efficient as yeah. companies want oh, to be more sure. and more Especially profitable. Because, you know, the redwood materials, which is probably going to be one of the larger recyclers, is, you know, run by J.B. Straubel, who, you know, is one of the big founders of Tesla. Right. And, like, oh. that's his passion. Hmm. So he went from building cars to recycling batteries. Like, his passion is batteries. Yeah. He's an extremely intelligent guy, and he'll definitely deliver yeah. on that. Yeah. Um, people are asking uh, about the right to repair and why Tesla is so anti right to repair. Like I know there's been a lot of there's media op- attention against yeah, that. Yeah. I mean, I'd say obviously in the last two months, it's big. They've events. opened up quite Huge. a bit. Yeah. And you can, anybody now can pay a subscription, I think, to get Toolbox, which is their internal tool to flash it and do other things. That's Actually, amazing. I, I haven't tried. Oh, so um, regular auto shops could learn and yeah. service and Tesla. I don't know. think. They can order parts, they can see the parts catalog, they can see the service manuals, they can see the electrical diagrams, they can do all that. So that's still going better than... They, yeah, one of the things right now is parts, but getting that is a whole different problem that's not related to right to repair. But um, as far as like right to repair goes, 
every company needs to get more on board. Apple, Tesla, Rivian, any automaker. Like, yeah. no, bar none, the industry sucks at right to repair. Right. And I'm very thankful for the European Union and its right to repair laws. They're much stronger and they're pushing really well. Canada's pushing really hard. The U.S. is definitely far behind on that. Massachusetts is leading that. Um, but there's been, like, progress with the DMCA laws that allows us to, like, you know, hack our own cars and do our things. Like, once it's sold, it's, like, our thing to mess up. Like, let's mm-hmm. say you hacked your car to do something. It's, like, yeah, I did that. But it's, like, the automaker would be, like, no, that's ours. You're not allowed to do that. And there's still some arguments both ways on how that plays out. Mm. Um, and that is related to right to repair to some extent, right? Okay. Like, I want to modify my car how I want to. Right. right. So, um, you know, my feelings is right to repair bar none and partially why I got laid off from Tesla is like I did some things that were pushing towards right to repair and was really working on that. Um, but legal at the end of the day is always protecting liability and they see right to repair as a liability. And there is certain levels of it too, like Massachusetts new right to repair laws. Like you should be able to recover any information from the computer on the car. And it's like, well, in the case of Tesla, it's like, Phone contacts, phone numbers, addresses, home address, where you've been, all that stuff. Big right to privacy there. Big privacy implications. That's Tesla's argument. And it's like, okay, then like we should determine what should be exposed. Yeah. Yeah. Stuff that's related to the car. Yeah. Yeah. And or like make it so that like when a car is resold, we've determined and built out policies and or developed methods that are standardized for wiping those computers. Right. So like right now, it's like you go to that screen, you hit factory reset. That's fine, but there should be, like, maybe you plug in a dongle to any car and we define the standard where it just wipes it clean, you know, or something like that, where for all cars or devices, like, there's always the same method to remove your personal data from a device. Like, right. there should be methods of making it safe. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and we were back to a oh, yeah. side part of that, like, why Tesla's right to repair. That was part of the question, is, like, yeah. why, it's, why have they been so against it? And you and I were talking about this the other day, that, like, probably i think what you were saying is probably a lot of it's just about liability like yeah. they don't want to be responsible for people yeah. hurting themselves the or damaging mm-hmm. their car. yeah and right. the news like exactly the tesla wouldn't exist if they weren't so strict to some extent there would be so many people messing up early on and yeah. now they can start to open up because it's wide enough there's enough competition yeah. there's things like they're and they have enough money to have a safety net yeah, yeah, like true. early on if they got sued or if there was a big news story they could have gone out of business right away so exactly. easily at any point like n- a number lot, of years still ago still a bunch of silly laws they're not laws with policy so a good example is supercharging right and we'll talk about it just only in this context which is that you know if your car is wrecked and you fix it you still can't supercharge um, tesla used to have a method where you could fix your car you could take it into tesla service and they'd recertify it and it get supercharged Right. Now, you can go in, you can get it recertified, and you still can't supercharge. That's ridiculous. Yeah. And you can't fast charge at all, for that fact. And you it's, like, impossible. You can't charge on CCS, you can't chat you can't do anything. Why? That's the question. I don't yeah. know why that policy changed. I don't know what's going on there. And I think that's a great example of, like, progress that they could be making is developing or producing, you know, maybe determining a third-party method where they... Because, like, maybe Tesla Service doesn't have the bandwidth to do it, but determine and certify... Maybe a few companies, like maybe their body shops, to certify that repair, right? So that people could do that again, because like, you know, their goal is to be bring sustainable transportation to the masses. Well, it's not sustainable if your car is single use. That's been that's always been my argument yeah. about it. Too, so like. I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done there. And salvage vehicles aren't bad. And electric vehicles, specifically salvage electric vehicles, are one of the easiest things to fix and get running again safely. Yeah, you know, and it's like yes, there might be buy or so do that, and like some people are willing to take on the cost but not the insurance company. Insurance company's there to make money and it's not worth their time right. to mess with that. So there's definitely that. And I do know that like in the past, like certain things specifically around supercharging were based on landowners, actually, fun fact. So it's talking to the old policymaker around supercharging and it sounds like, you know, when there was that one Tesla fire, I think it was in Norway, while supercharging, right? That landowner was freaking out. It was like, I don't want that liability on my property. Mm-hmm. right so then tesla's like i don't know and then all these other landowners like i don't want that on my property either it wasn't even a salvage tesla it was just a normal just one a it wasn't repaired correctly and it's just like oh you know what you know they they all freaked out and like we don't want this on the, our property as our liability so tesla basically was like okay no more supercharging because these landowners aren't willing to work with us Right. And mm. for them, for them expanding their charging network, that is their most important goal. That's a huge, goal. yeah. Right. right. And I think I would agree with that common goal. Like, if you had to choose between this 1% being able to charge, mm-hmm. and that's a 99% having better infrastructure, what would you pick? Oh, of course. 
Because you need good for the greatest number. Yeah. You yeah. need that infrastructure in certain places. You, need, you need it by movie theaters, malls, places where people are spending time. Exactly. And a lot of those are owned by one person that owns a ton of property that wants as little liability as possible. Exactly. So they need to build up trust and kind of find a way of doing that. And there's, you know, Tesla's looking at, they've already started to open up their supercharging network in Europe to CCS. So now home build EVs are charging on their stuff there, which is a whole different thing. Like, oh, that's really cool. There's a lot of automakers that. lobbying against home built or conversion vehicles now, mm. which is a whole different problem that's about to start coming down the pipeline. Unfortunate. Yeah. yeah, it's super unfortunate because like people can learn to do things right, even if they're not doing it perfectly. Is it really someone else's liability and or protection on them? So, just something that's coming down the pipeline to keep an eye on, like if when you're voting and stuff. Like if you see bills related to that, make sure you really understand it. But, you know, if you want to continue having the ability to tinker and do stuff, we got to make sure that we're focused on that. Well, should we do one more question and then take the mini boat in the lake? I'd say so. Yeah. It's getting okay. warm. I think so. It's getting warm. I'm feeling the sun from over here. Oh, yeah. I seriously, stoked. it's time. Are we going to the big lake? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, the pond is, we've, we've outgrown Sheesh. the pond. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Um, and the pond is also shrinking. It dries up this time of year. I'm looking for a good one. Yeah. I've looked through all of them. There's a okay. lot of people asking you why you hate V8s. What? <laughs> which you don't. He, he owns, you own like, like, four 7.3 power strokes, which yeah. are V8s. But there's a lot of people asking you why you're so awesome, and then there's a lot of people asking you, is Elon an alien? Yes. Oh. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Answer let's... That question, but I, 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 I do really question. question if he's from this planet. Yeah. No, All right. I so let's talk about that, and then let's just praise... Gas and diesel cars for a while. Yeah, we're just call talking about the podcast cool. as yeah. well. Okay, let's do that. So <laughs> why is Elon an alien? I mean, I feel like it's self-explanatory. He's trying to get back to his planet. And like, like, That's what <laughs> Why do you think he has a home. space company? Like, you know? He's got to get home. He's got to yeah. get home somehow. Okay. So, makes okay. sense. <laughs> yeah. I saw that. What, what was that meme we were looking at the other day that showed? Because, like, he looks really weird in side profile. His chest sticks out like super And it's like a little picture. dude in Elon. It was like, like a little person inside of him driving. I haven't seen that one. Dude, that meme. Who showed us that? throw that on the screen. I, I think like it's just been searched. Steven will pull yeah. it up and yeah. we'll throw it on uh-huh. like, over here. That was Scrappy Doo in one of the live action Scooby Doo episodes. He was like inside of a bigger. Oh, yeah. 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 Or like uh-huh. um, Men in Black. Uh, I don't remember which one. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah the yeah, little yeah. alien Men dude in, in the game. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. That seems realistic. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it and he does like think about things and s- he seems to have the capacity for so much information compared to regular. Oh. Well, Elon mortals. gets things done. We all totally have that exact same capacity. It's just. I think there's plenty of good books out there, like Principles being one I've been reading recently that really talk about, like, how to use your time more effectively. And then, like, it's it's just, like, he knows how to use his time. Like, he spends his time learning, and then, like, all of the execution, like, he executes on certain parts and focuses on macro-level things, but still really tries to understand the micro as well. Yeah. But how can you be his age and work that much? Like, do you think there is some help from drugs or something? Or There's rumors. <laughs> <laughs> okay that's all i can say because i really don't know yeah to be honest. I mean, yeah because some people are definitely just like wired differently like some people work totally fine on like yeah. four or five hours of sleep a night like when casey neistat first started doing his youtube thing he was sleeping three hours a day for like five years you could see like his skin deteriorating <laughs> but he still was able his to mentally do it. able to yeah, you I can really just train your body to do whatever you need it to do you can and but you can focus on productivity instead of Scrolling. I, 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 I was going to say no, when you said that he uses his yeah. time well. I was like, some, he's probably not spending all the time doom scrolling. Although I yeah. know Twitter would like maybe. Yeah, Twitter's, he's on Twitter, Twitter quite a bit. Argue yeah. With that statement, yeah, in that context, maybe. But <laughs> um, I mean, when you look at that, like you know, I'm I'm pretty neurodivergent, and like I just can't do certain things. That's fine, and like some people can do more things better. But like if we all figure out what we're good at and can do, we have a really high capacity to do really crazy things. It's mm-hmm. just like. We might not think it, but that's because a lot of us don't push ourselves. Yeah. Right? And he's always like, that looks like it sucks. Let's try it, you know? Mm -hmm. He's pushing himself to the upper bounds of what, like, probably what he should be doing or can do. And, you know, more and more people hopefully will start doing that to some extent. Like, you know, should have a passion to be passionate, realistically. Yeah. Like, no matter what it is. Okay. It makes yep. sense because you can train yourself to do an endurance run. Yeah. You could be like marathon, someone who gets whatever. completely exhausted after running four miles, but you could train to and do go 100. Miles, yeah. So yep. 
you could also train yourself to work 16 hours a day and have it not even phase you. Yeah, or work less <laughs> more effectively, right? Yeah, like, you yeah. Know, mm-hmm. focus on, like, the important problems and, like, you know, instead of doom scrolling before bed, you're, like, thinking, like, what do I want to work on tomorrow? And then you wake up, you know what yeah. you want to do, and the first 30 minutes, you've already done your entire day. Yeah. I have noticed that. A lot of times, if I'm editing and get kind of stuck, I'll, like, try to just dive back in even if i'm done working i'll just dive back in for like 20 minutes and i'll just wake up knowing the answer yeah it's It's like the brains are crazy like that even in like video games i've been like stuck on like some strategy games (laughs) at night you wake up and you're like (laughs) done great brain's solving the problem while you're sleeping a great example is the tesla like i went to bed like why is the headlight not working Mm -hmm. and i woke up and was like all right i think i know exactly like what i want to do in the steps and like man did i get defeated multiple times but like i already had (laughs) thought about all the steps leading up to that and so it's like each defeat didn't feel as much of a defeat no so you know it's important to take that time but also to like use that time when you wake up and when you sleep to think through you you know it's not about other people in the world and what they're doing Mm -hmm. well i think we should mention the v8 question well it's kind of fun because we got this kind of like when we first introduced the tesla to the channel people were like oh no grind hard's gonna turn into a tesla channel or a electronics channel channel. Yeah. yeah and it's like it's so not like that it's like if I had the opportunity to have any car as a daily driver, it would be a Tesla just to like get to work and be comfortable and drive itself. The well, no, assist can. features are just so amazing. Yeah. Once we get those, but it's open. like I drive yeah. my Dodge every day, you know, the and first that's car like, I ever bought. Still. It, yeah. <laughs> it's just like reliable and does everything I needed to do. And I brought, you know, five yards of gravel to my house last week. Like trucks are just awesome. And, the ma- massive, massive and it's majority. A V8. Very puny, it, it, sad V8. <laughs> but it honest. is a V8. <laughs> but it's like a lot of the projects that we're going to do and continue to do on this channel, even as electric vehicles get more and more relevant, are going to be gas engines because it's like relatable and fun and the sounds and like there's a time and place for everything. Yeah. Yeah. I just think that electric vehicles get a lot of the news attention and a lot of the attention on podcasts yeah. youtube videos because, because it's, it's so exciting and it's so yeah, new it's different and it's, yeah. it's something to change the norm and yeah. like a good example is like i definitely don't hate the eights a every i don't even own an electric car right now that was <laughs> another have, question is if you owned an electric car i so. have owned i've owned a few and um i think if you ever get a chance to look it up look up a corbin sparrow that was one of my first mm-hmm. electric cars that sounds cool it's very goofy it was a pink polka dot stock Huh? Really? Stock vehicle. I got it. I traded it for some work on a Nissan Leaf, and a guy gave it to me. It was a very goofy one-seater electric car. Wow. But um, I've had I've had a Tesla, and like right now, the only reason I mean I don't really drive normally. I live in New York, so like for context, like I live in yeah. my van a lot of time in New York, and it's parked in the same spot every single day. And like I have secret spots for that, but you know I mainly transport via bike or subway or whatever. So it's like I don't need another car right yeah. now. So like I don't even daily. If I was dailying, I would definitely have a hybrid or an electric for sure but you know i have like some short buses i got a few vanigans i got all these things that are recreational go out weekend go get her stuff which the electric market just hasn't hit it's yet. not there that's yet. just that's no. it's not because it's not there technology wise just no it just built. doesn't exist yet yeah, yeah. and there's mm-hmm. some companies that have like electric products that fall in that category like maxwell vehicles is converting um electric vans and using tesla drivetrains for instance which is really cool um, but like, I just haven't bought one yet or haven't gotten down that road. But like the thing said, I have two Rivians on pre-order order. I have an R1T and an R1S. And then I also have a Bronco Raptor on pre-order. So it's like, yeah. you know, some things <laughs> just don't go away. It's like, I want to jump stuff and do fun things. And there's a lot to be learned from both industries still. And that being said, Ford's probably going to build a lot more electric and things like that. I think just the gas engine as we see it now is going to change and that you're not going to see any more inline four cylinder commuters or three cylinder whatever. Like almost all of your commuters and dailies are going to be electric. But those aren't the exciting cars in the first place, you know? Yeah. And that's the thing. mm -hmm. Like those are like the easy grab for electric. It's like, it just makes your commute a little bit easier and more convenient. So it's like sweet, cheaper. Yeah. And cleaner. Yeah. yeah. Which is (laughs) really the primary thing. And you'll see a lot of delivery trucks and, Basically yeah. anything commercial and like I think the fun stuff like you know racing weekends off roading that like gas is gonna stay in that for yeah. quite some time and, yeah. and that we'll makes see a lot more of these niche cars like get deeper and more intense like you might see really crazy engines that are used for more of that and hopefully fuel cost drops with it because there's less demand yeah mm-hmm. I mean if you think about it from that aspect like if you're somebody who like really loves internal combustion 
and you should you equally love electric. electric. You should love EVs because they're going to reduce the cost of fuel. Maybe. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, right theory, now, hopefully. Yeah. Not I mean, right now, not right immediately now. on a day-to-day, but like... No. In theory, right. yeah. I mean, like, the, the, hopefully, this is assuming that fuel production stays the same. Stays the same. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. yeah, it's not it's not like it's not guaranteed, but it's certainly not going to hurt it. No, definitely <laughs> like, not. I mean, like imagine just like your commute is just no. you're not banging gears in traffic and just like no. you know, like your left foot is like swollen like with mm-hmm. the amount of times mm-hmm. you press the clutch yeah. on your way in. No. It's just like I don't know how you guys feel. I love driving, but I hate commuting. Oh, That's yeah, like the thing. Like I. Would rather just sit there and like listen, read a book. Like it's, I mean, right now, as being said, I've never, I haven't finished a book in like ten years. But like, <laughs> yeah. I like read part of the book. I, on, more, to be more honest, I'd rather doom scroll and watch Netflix and maybe <laughs> listen to an audio book if I'm really feeling inspired. But like, you know, that'd be great. Like, watch some YouTube videos on your commute, get some more things, and maybe pick a something that's better for you. Like maybe like watch some like educational content or something yeah. like along that right. side. But maybe you're not. Maybe you're just having fun doing maybe whatever. That's, but maybe like, that's you're, your time to scroll while you're pooping, uh, metaphorically. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or just, like, think about just stuff, you know? I mean, you do that while driving, too. But, like, yeah. um, I know for me, I'm just, like, y- yeah, you just, like, Let's once just you're in that there. routine not, yeah. and you're just tired, you're doing stupid things. And, like, nah, I'm a lazy driver now. I just, like, I go slow. I go to the speed limit. I hang out and, like, let other people pass me. I'm, like, what am I in a hurry for? Like, right. it's seconds in the scheme of things. Yeah. Yeah, so. Especially if you're in a van you live in with all your stuff. Yeah. That's <laughs> not that being said, speed. I have <laughs> driven fast. Me and a buddy did a cannonball and set a record. But Dude, uh, that's sick. Yeah, that was fun. What were you in? Uh, Model 3. So we set the electric all-wheel drive record. We were off a little bit because he kept using autopilot. So mm. um, it slowed us down a lot. I had to make up for that at night. I won't disclose <laughs> <what's> exactly <laughs> how fast I had to drive. But um, Did you do that? The record has a lot of room to be broken, the long story short. Mm. Mm. Um, so the, been wait, the record still stands. No, oh. I mean we have the all-wheel drive record. The true electric record is still was held even after that. So we did that, and I didn't feel like doing the return route. Uh, so another person did it with him on the return route, and then they beat it that time, and then they did it again recently, and then beat that overall electric record. Hmm. So um, pretty cool. There's a lot of room there still to be beaten. Uh, I don't know if I'll ever do a cannonball again. It was like a dream to do it. And I was like, I did it. It seems miserable. It is 99% miserable. Um, (laughs) And then 1% like kind of fun. Yeah. The planning is the fun part. The execution is the not so fun. (laughs) (laughs) So there's still a lot of fun there. And I hope people can really appreciate electric as like, it's not a threat. It's not coming after you. It's coming after all the people who aren't car people. Yeah. It's a lot of sense. And it is fun. Like it is. I think hybrid stuff is going to get really cool. Uh, Yeah. Maybe I want to do some really, we've talked about this while you've been here. I want to do some really freaky stuff with hybrids, like use an insanely cool engine in something that makes absolutely no sense, but use it to generate electricity. Like take a Hayabusa engine and put it in our fire truck to generate electricity for a, you know, or, we also talked about making a Hayabusa engine into a really high output generator to charge your Tesla. Yeah. Like just as an accessory. Like if you want super long road trips, you strap your Hayabusa engine to the roof and now it generates electricity for you. Or, yeah. you know, something yeah. crazy. Something Could silly you? like that because you can yeah. do so much cool stuff. Yeah. And yeah. It's, I think the knowledge that comes mm-hmm. with learning how to do that will also make you appreciate electric in a lot of ways. Yeah. It's just the simplicity. I like personally, like I've been working on my diesels lately and I'm like just. I instantly hate what I'm doing because I'm just so covered in grease. Like I can't, yeah, yeah. I want to eat food, but I know I'm dying. I'm killing myself one year at a time with the amount of like carbon intake I'm taking with that. And I'm just like, wow, this that's is terrible. So, like, I mean, yeah. we saw yesterday, we still get dirty working on electric. It's just but not dirt. as dirty. Yeah. It's like, it, the, come, look at my hands. Like right now, see, they're clean. They were <laughs> filthy yesterday. That comes why, off. Yeah. yeah. That's why that's I only have electric dirt bikes now yeah. because it's like, they're not as good as gas dirt bikes in any way. But I just, you know, if I'm working on stuff, I just want it to be easier and cleaner and just, I don't have time you to just like, leave it. you yeah, just let it sit there and you come back and you just plug it in and it runs. It's not like you yeah. really go do yeah, like, you clean yeah, your car bowls, yeah. clean your floats, yeah. like clean the I don't carbs. have time to do all that. I hardly yeah. even have time to ride. Yeah. So it's like, I just want to grab the thing, ride, bring it home and charge the battery and be done. Yeah. There's a, there's a lot of pros and cons to both sides of the argument. Yeah. And no. I think... It's important as car enthusiasts to appreciate. But look, I mean, look at Rich, which is a great example. His channel oh, yeah. is pure electric stuff. Now it's like, I have no idea what's happening. But <laughs> yeah, he's hardly doing anything electric. Yeah. He's doing all sorts of yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, he's, he's just trying to piss off electric it. owners. It seems yeah. like with just like, oh, I got diesel swap model three. I'm like, cool. Like, that's awesome. I love that you're doing it. And the, I mean, the, not Dolores, but um, the the V8, the Ice tea. Was, Ice tea. Ice tea was beautiful build. Finally, someone did it. It's mm-hmm. been discussed for so long. And it's just like, it's a screw you, but it's also a great example of like that chassis is 800 pounds body and white. 
Well, like that thing is a light car. It's all aluminum. Yeah. Like the opportunity it's, for a car enthusiast right. on both sides is great. Like, oh, take mm-hmm. an electric car, put gas in it, and it's like sweet. You can do all kinds of other crazy things you couldn't do before because like yeah. all of the material, light dating, and all these things. Like we also argue like everyone's like steel, big, whatever. It's like well, you're probably gonna die because it's now your body taking all the impact, but <laughs> you know, inside of the car. But yeah, there's so many interesting opportunities on both sides. Yeah. So I'm yeah. excited to see where the industry goes on, no matter what. Yeah. How doable is it? The Hayabusa charging while you're driving accessory. Because I've oh, talked to Rich impossible. and Steven about they built a battery trailer, but they never got it working because charging and driving the Tesla at the same time proved to be a big problem. It's not that hard. You could do it? Oh, yeah. Oh, sweet. Ah. Let's do it. I mean, just from, just from like our... <laughs> I, should say, I should say, like, not I, that hard is relative. That's <laughs> <laughs> They may have been trying to do it just through the charging port. Yeah. Which... Would probably never no. work. Yeah. Maybe but it is. If you tap into a deeper level dryer. system, <laughs> yeah, 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 a hair dryer get would do it. To the battery. It's, it's true. If we use a hair dryer, all of his problems will be solved. Yeah. That's what was actually going on. So not so okay. Let's dryer. do that. He's probably yeah. using, you know, like a Sephora instead of a Conair. Yeah, yeah that's, that's probably, probably what was going yeah. on. Yeah. So, two, so, <laughs> two hair. That's yeah. true. I haven't tried hair dryers in parallel. So, or series. Series hair dryers. It's like a compound turbo, basically. Yeah, if we could get enough hair dryers to like make something move, we should I build mean, something out of hair dryers. <laughs> well, we should. I mean, we should end it there. We'll end it with uh, air dryer Hayabusa powered Tesla coming soon. Something like <laughs> <Not> that. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> be great. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Please take your naked phone away from me. I don't want to have it in my possession. Well, every time I hand this to anyone here, they're like, put. Yeah, 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 that's yeah, that's I, I feel savage. savage. I don't know.